Please you, mute. Which, let me Please mute. Please mute Sorry. your line. All right, well, good morning and welcome to the Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Task Force meeting. We will begin by calling the roll, Alex. Good morning, everyone. As I have previously, I'll begin with task force leadership, proceed through the governor's appointments, our legislative appointments, and finally, representatives from our executive agencies, beginning with Chair McElroy. Present. Vice Chair Dieferheimer. Present. I'll begin calling the names of the governor's appointments in alphabetical order, starting with Addison. Beach. Here. Blau. Bolin. Present. Brockman. Here. Road. Berman. Present. Drost. Present. Hawkwall. I had a message from her. She indicated she would be late today. Thank you. Johnson. Pakunka. Mahajan. Reese is excused. Russell. Schiffel. Smith. Here. Stevic Rust. Thompson. Van Runkle. Here. I'll again call the name Addison. Here. Blau. Road. Here. Johnson. Pakanka. Mahajan. Mahajan. Russell. Russell. Schiffel. Schiffel. Steve Across. Here. Thompson. Sorry, here. I was muted. Alex, this is Joe Russell. I'm here. I think I missed you. Oh. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Joe. I'll now proceed with our legislative appointments, beginning with Leader Yuko. Senator Wilson. Representative Creech. Here. Representative House. Here. I'll again call the name Leader Yuko. And Senator Wilson. <clears throat> I'll now call representatives, <coughs> excuse me, from our executive agencies, Director Corcoran, Director Ashenhurst. I'm here by phone today. Thank you. Ombudsman Laubert. Present. I'll again call the name Director Corcoran. Chair McElroy, you do have a quorum. All right, thank you, Alex. I think next up is a review of the meeting minutes. If you want to walk us through that, please. I certainly will. I'll give everyone another moment to consider the minutes. Do we have a motion to Please approve the minutes? Please. We have a motion from Pete Van Runkle to approve the minutes. We have a second. Second. Joe, was that you? That was Trey. Oh, Trey, sorry. 
We, uh, with a motion from Pete Van Runkle and a second from Trey Addison. Do we have any objections to approving the minutes? No objections, but Alex, my name is misspelled. Yeah, Alex, this is Sally Bowl and mine is too. And the only other thing that I wondered, and Bev, um, Bob Butzman, Robert might be better on that, but I noticed with the notes, um, it talked about the missing adult alert program. And I think one of the things that we talked about was maybe like the next step, you know, so like, uh, um, I just wonder if that, if it's accurately, I just wonder if it needs to be a little bit further elaborated in the minutes in regards to further follow up um, once someone's been found. So, agreed. Thank you. Well, thank you for those comments. Um, I guess, Pete, would you like to offer your motion again to approve the minutes pending amendment? Yes. Right, we have a new motion from Pete Van Runkle to approve the minutes as amended. Do we have a second? Second. And a second again from Trey Addison. Is there any objection to approving the minutes as amended? Hearing no objection, the minutes will stand approved as amended. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alex. And I just have a couple of announcements and things I wanna cover in my report. And then I wanna leave the balance of the time for much of the work that we have to do on our pretty aggressive timeline. Uh, so first, I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. Uh, we had, <laughs> I see thumbs up. So any indication that you had a good holiday is certainly, uh, Welcome. I hope that everyone had a chance to maybe rest and uh, spend some time doing the things that you wanted to do. So um, again, welcome back. Uh, second, when we last spoke, we were eagerly awaiting the uh, signing of the 2022-23 operating budget, uh, amended substitute House Bill 110, uh, which does include or did include an income tax cut for all Ohioans. Uh, and certainly supports the priorities of the DeWine Houston administration. Um, just a, a few areas to touch upon. Um, the new operating budget did invest in growing the skilled workforce, uh, expanding access to affordable child care, addressing substance use disorders, uh, supporting citizen mental health and well being. Um, also, very huge expanding access to broadband enhancing the K through 12 learning, expanding some of the priority health programs. Uh, there was a big emphasis on supporting local government and aiding in public safety. So I wanna address a few things very specific to uh, within the aging space. Um, first, we were really excited that we were able to see increases in the senior community services line item, still across the biennium of approximately $2 million. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the Senior Community Services line item, these are home and community-based services where it allows us to be able to support home and community-based services to make it possible for Odor Highlands to age in place. Um, they include things such as in-home health care services, home delivered meals, and transportation, just to name a few. The funding also makes it possible to enhance the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program and this is really important because it helps us ensure Odo Highlands have access to locally grown nutritious food at affordable prices. So we're really excited about that, particularly given the flexibility with that funding. Also want to bring to your attention that we were able to maintain or have continued funding for the Alzheimer's and other dementia respite line item. This is funding that supports family caregivers of those living with dementia by providing family education, caregiver breaks such as respite care, personal care for individuals, as well as counseling and support groups, 
Uh, it also provides resources to caregivers to help them keep uh, their loved ones at home and in the community um, if a facility level care is not needed just yet. So really excited about that. There also was continued funding for the long-term care ombudsman. Um, our ombudsman uh, will have the funding to continue their work at the state's independent advocate, as the state's independent advocate, pardon me, um, for those receiving long-term care. The ombudsman has been instrumental during the pandemic um, for those. So, and in fact, um, they've been very pleased with their work throughout the state. Uh, they've been able to uphold the rights and support dignity and demand quality and care for residents and uh, to support and provide information to their families. So they have been serving for many years as the critical link, but it became very obvious during the pandemic just how important they are. Um, they were really instrumental, for example, in helping residents and families during the period when there were limitations on visitation. So also wanna point out that um, there is provider certification. This is new for, for the department. It's provider certification for those who are non-Medicaid providers traditionally. The department has certified Medicaid providers largely or only, and so now this will allow us to certify and to put in place, if you will, those standards and to monitor those standards for non-Medicaid providers as well. We believe this will help us uh, not only with making sure that there is quality of care, but it also supports our overall efforts toward elder justice. So we feel very excited about that. Um, there is also um, the, I think there was a lot of interest as well in the provider rates in the home and community-based services uh, space. Um, the governor, while he uh, vetoed the rates as listed in the bill, has made very clear that the intent, uh, that the idea is to still stay very close to the legislative intent uh, with the uh, with increasing the rates and in, in, in those amounts. And then finally, the strategic aging, pardon me, the state aging uh, initiatives line. Uh, this was a line that we were hopeful to see pass. Uh, this was a line that we had $23 million in across the biennium, a portion set aside to help with training and technical assistance in long-term care facilities and the balance to be able to support um, a large range of efforts that were focused on healthy aging and allowing people to age in place. Um, that did not make it into the final operating budget. And so uh, we are disappointed about that. But at the same time, as a team, we have already uh, regrouped and are beginning to look at ways to still see forward, to still move forward on some of those very critical um, efforts uh, within what we've referred to um, as the sale. So I wanted to just provide some brief updates. Uh, one other, which is not contained within our budget, but we were absolutely supportive of, is that there are some, we believe, enhanced opportunities for our uh, colleagues at the Ohio Department of Health uh, to uh, become engaged when necessary uh, in uh, situations within long-term care facilities where we have concerns uh, about uh, perhaps the care or the, any concerns of deficiencies in, in care for the residents. So that was a very quick summary. What we can do um, are a couple of things. One, we will be sharing with Sage Squirrel, um, as we mentioned in the last meeting, um, House Bill 470. I think along with that, we will also provide um, a pretty good summary of and links to items within the operating budget. Uh, for those of you who may not follow it as closely or may not have access to it or don't necessarily want to go through many, many, many pages. And so we can be certain that we provide you with a high level summary so that you'll have that at your fingertips as well. So it looks like I see a hand uh, up, uh, Jean. 
Oh, uh, thank you, Director. Um, you know, clearly, uh, even in this set of meetings, we've talked about assisted living's uh, waiver reimbursement being very low and unable to accommodate a lot of dementia care uh, because of that. Well, what we are wondering, or our members are wondering, and we have certainly seen those comparison documents and the governor's comments that he is supportive of the increase. Could you give us a rough idea of when all of that might happen, given that it's not in the budget anymore? Right. So it, it would be premature for me to give you exact time frame. But what I will say is that we are going to move on it quickly. Similar to, if you recall, in the last budget, um, our 2021 budget, uh, at that time, we were able to uh, I believe we were able to get people together. I, I recall you were part of the meetings. Others were part of the meetings to sort of discuss, look at things. And we believe we put forward something uh, in a pretty meaningful way. Um, likewise, this time it will certainly involve uh, the Department of Aging, the Department of Medicaid um, and the Department of Developmental Disabilities to uh, minimally to have discussion um, to see how do we move forward to do this in a way that is very much aligned with the intent of the legislature. So, um, Jean, I don't have an exact date to give you, just to let you know that we do intend to work expeditiously on it. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, can I have a follow up to that, please, Purcell? Yes, Pete. Um, I think, and, and I, I think I might echo Jean a little bit on this, is, um, and your reference to last time is, is a little bit, um, maybe not so comforting because yes there was discussion that occurred immediately but the rates didn't actually get changed until the following march um, now they went they were earlier for my care but for the fee for service program it wasn't until march and hopefully it will be a lot sooner than that this time right so my response to that would be last time was a bit more complicated as you recall because the dollars that were put in in the last budget did not account for my care and so there was, and so we had to be very thoughtful about how we were going to do it in a way that still would have meaningful impact. And so this time there was already that consideration for my care. So there was a bit of a, I think I would say more of a complication last time than this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay, so with that, I know we have a, Jean, did you still have your hand up or did you just not put it down on virtually? Okay, <laughs> I want to make sure. <laughs> I forgot to take it, sorry. Okay, <laughs> okay. so with that, I do want to turn things over to both Yonda and Leanne with Statesboro. Good morning, everyone. I will, um, I will echo that I hope you had a wonderful long weekend and restful and we're able to just take some time to sort of unwind a little bit. Um, we have a couple of things that we're going to sort of shift around. Um, so I, I'm just gonna kind of go through my notes because there are things I wanna make sure I tell you. Um, one, let me ask really quickly, um, is there anyone on the call right now that needs to leave early today? I, I realized um, at our last task force meeting, um, I actually think it was Representative House, uh, to whom I apologize, um, that you needed to leave early. And just in the way I had set up the roster, um, by the time I got to you, you were almost heading out the door. And um, it occurred to me I should figure that out ahead of time and make sure those folks have ample opportunity to contribute. Um, um, so is there anybody that needs to leave early today that um, we, we should make sure has the chance to join the conversation early in the conversation? This is Debbie Ashenhurst. I have to leave at 11. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Assuming that you know, <laughs> I realized you might also be running out the door. I, yeah, I, I will have. I will have to leave. I have a, a 10 o'clock, so I will have to leave. But my hope is to be able to return. OK, great. Thank Things you so much. 10 o'clock, though, so OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> um, OK, um, two more things. Um, Yonda and I had a chance to have a conversation with the director on Friday, I think it was. 
Um, and um, we talked about the uh, trying to create some more opportunity for um, a bit more uh, of that sort of, I think, Director, your, line, your words were organic uh, conversation. And we've we've been cautious to to have too much leeway, obviously, because we really wanted to make sure that we heard we sort of accomplished two things. One is that we heard from everybody uh, who wanted to contribute and that we could really get through our buckets. Um, our buckets today are are a little more broad and probably much more flexible and in fact, cross almost all the other buckets. So we feel like this is a really good opportunity to um, perhaps have a little bit less rigidity and um, and create more space for that kind of back and forth dialogue. At the same time, I really want to make sure that anybody who wants to contribute has an opportunity to do that. So, um, so what I will try to do today is not so much limit the you have two minutes for conversation, but after uh, ask you to try as best you can to stick to that two ish minutes time frame. But after about three people, we'll stop and really see if there's other. Um, kind of responses to that or other information that people want to add before they uh, to whatever was just specifically said before they have a chance um, uh, for their their specific time, if that makes sense. I'm a little worried about trying to do one on one. One person speaks, one person responds, one person speaks, one person responds. I think we um, we don't have quite enough time for that. And I'm a little concerned about being able to get through. Um, but I thought we would try that this morning. Um, two other things. Um, before we met with uh, the director on Friday, we sent out the agenda and the materials, and we were using the language of findings. Um, and we uh, we came to the the realization, sort of our own finding, if you will, our own conclusion, um, that really what we have right now are observations. Um, as we are still collecting data, as we're still kind of attaching data points to the information that we have, um, we're going to use the language of conclusions and observations. So you'll see findings in the agenda, um, in the hard copy of the slide deck that we sent you, we still use the language of findings, but since Friday we have changed that. Um, the other thing that you don't yet have, and we will, um, excuse me, we will send this out following today's meeting, is we, um, after our conversation with uh, Director McElroy on Friday, we went ahead and um, kind of pulled out very high level, and I really want to stress super high level um, observations from the current list of observations, conclusions, uh, findings. Um, and we've put those on one slide. So you have to imagine, given the numbers that there are, if we fit it onto one slide and it's actually fairly legible, um, that it's super high level. Um, but uh, you don't have that yet because, again, we did that after we met with the director. Uh, you will see that this morning and we'll go ahead and, and get that out to you um, after the meeting. Um, and then the last question I just have is um, uh, for Pete and for Director McElroy, whoever is, is best to answer. Um, in that last conversation, you mentioned something called my care. Um, and that's not language I've heard yet, and we want to make sure we understand what that is. Um, it sounds like it's either a an initiative, a program, or something. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about that? That'll take three years. Okay. <laughs> I'm well, going to need two minutes. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a really high level. And then if you need more detail, we can talk about it after. But it is a, it's more of a demonstration program that we have here in the state of Ohio. Uh, it is our managed care. Uh, it's run by our managed yeah. care organizations. And it is for those individuals in the state of Ohio who are duly eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare. I believe right now we're operating in, in 27 counties. If I'm off by a number, Doug, feel free to correct me. But I believe we have it in about 27 of the counties of our 88 counties that have my care. So it's going to be those who are 65 and older who qualify for mm -hmm. waiver services, uh, but they're duly eligible. And it is still within the demonstration phase. And director, I will just say thank you for the language of people who are duly eligible. Uh, coming out of working in a federal consulting healthcare space, the language of duels is really common and it just makes me cringe when we refer to people as that. And so mm -hmm. talking about people who are duly eligible just warms my heart. Thank you for that language. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's Appreciate interesting it. you said that, Leanne. Actually, just as an aside, I had a conversation yesterday. It was another sector. It was not the aging sector. And uh, their reference to individuals uh, uh, was um, 
it was common jargon in which I offered a very um, kind correction. <laughs> how we refer to, I'll say it that way, well, and how we refer to people. I have spent most of my career in the advocacy world and and um, by both people who live with disabilities and other diagnoses um, and my own learning have really had that drilled into me. And I find it to be really a very, very important part of the bigger conversation is um, paying attention to how people wish to be uh, referred to. All right. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, we will uh, dive in here. Let me just pull this up. Um, and can you all see the slide that says agenda? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we we've obviously been through roll call. We've uh, handled approval the previous minutes. Thank you, director, for your welcome. We're going to do a high level review of observations. We have two themes and questions uh, today. Um, we may only get to one of those um, given the opportunity to have more conversation. Uh, we think that's okay. Um, we still have one more meeting and even though it's a little bit shorter, we think that's okay. Um, and we've really been doing quite well at staying on time. So um, so we'll, we'll play a little bit of that by ear, but I think we'll be okay with that. Um, and um, I think I skipped over our meeting agreements. Just a quick reminder for all of us, um, all contributions are important. I'll try really hard to give folks a 30 second warning or just gently interrupt if I need to. Uh, please mute your line if you're not speaking. Um, and just to remember to take care of yourself. Uh, we don't want you to be miserable if you can avoid it, okay? Um, all right, you know our buckets, early intervention, healthcare, long-term services and supports, safety and legal issues, policy evaluation, and then the broad topic of equity that impacts all of them. Um, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to Yanda. These are, again, very high level observations to date. Um, and I will say, um, I really struggled um, after I sort of wrote this, um, realizing that what I pulled out really were high level needs, challenges, and concerns. Um, and there, what I didn't end up pulling out is what are the things that are going really well? Um, and that wasn't absolutely intentional. I was really looking for themes that I could pull out to share with you. Um, and, and I just want to say out loud, that does not mean at all that, that there are not things that we're hearing that are going well and should continue. And that um, that the task force may even force make may in fact make recommendations uh, around how to continue those things. Um, so um, I just sort of wanted to point that out because we really don't want to have that fully deficit uh, focus. Um, though what you'll see here are those needs and challenges. Yanda, I'm going to stop and turn it over to you. Thanks, Leanne. Um, so uh, these really are very high level, as, as you can probably imagine. I think we ended up with about 12 pages of notes um, that had a whole series of, of statements that we had extracted over the course of the, the first two meetings, um, you know, capturing as much information as we could that, that really felt like an actual solid conclusion or observation on your part. Um, that 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 may contribute to the to the larger findings as, as we move that direction, um, and we wanted to uh, take some opportunity to share these with you. Um, and this will be part of our conversation more in depth next week. Um, and I want to kind of note too that uh, Leanne's point around uh, approaching things from a strengths based. Um, perspective. Uh, it it was hard in the first meeting in particular. Um, as we as we talked about the uh, long term care uh, sector and um, issues around uh, public safety and, and legal, those those two buckets, um, that was a pretty deficit focused um, conversation. Um, there was uh, almost everything that came out of that was focused on um, issues that were inadequacies in the system or deficiencies. Um, as we as we transitioned into the second week, we did actually hear more um, more positive things that that just aren't fully captured here. And and I want to note that um, those were largely around things that were happening at the community level. And uh, so those are things that we're going to want to um, you know dig a little bit more into as you know as as we develop out the findings because we don't want this to be a report. Um, that says, oh, everything's terrible in Ohio because everything's not terrible in Ohio. There are strengths to build from, um, and, and we want to be clear that that, that is going to be um, a, a part of the report. So 
um, having having sort of put that disclaimer out there, um, you know, we wanted to uh, start with just uh, there were several people over the course of the first two meetings that touched on the importance of influence of, of, of leadership and the role of organizational culture in affecting sustainable change. Um, you know, sometimes what we hear a lot of times is that the issue is just money. If we only had enough money, everything would be fine. Um, but but really um, affecting organizational change around around training, around systems of care, um, you know, is is a much bigger issue than just increasing rates. It's it's really about, you know, how how leaders and managers interact with people. It's your workforce culture. It's it's it it's practices, you know, it's all of your workforce practices that contribute to um, <clears throat> you know, actually driving change. It's it's part of, of, you know, making training really take hold in a system and keeping it ongoing. Um, it certainly is a factor when you start to talk about turnover of, of employees. Um, and, you know, certainly, wait, you know, rates and, and wages are a part of that, but we don't want to miss the fact that, that leadership and, and culture are also a big part of that. Um, there certainly has been um, a significant theme in the comments to date around the increased need for uh, caregiver support and resources for caregivers. Um, you know, that includes uh, respite, um, but I would note that it's not limited to respite. There were there have been comments around um, adult day, uh, certainly the role of technology in supporting people. There have been a lot of comments about um, people not being able to access the information and resources. And sometimes that's really been identified as a twofold challenge, either because they just don't know where to go or because of limitations in being able to use what is um, perceived as a very internet driven um, access methodology that they, that they simply can't use. <clears throat> and of course, um, the fact that people need support for planning. Um, there has been discussion around the increased need for, uh, in, you know, improved clinical training, uh, certainly at the med school level, improving the uh, quantity and quality of training in dementia for med schools, um, for first re responders, for people in emergency departments. Um, some of that has been flagged through uh, conversations about transitions of care and and the fact that people become really vulnerable because you know they may be coming from a place um, where people understand their needs and, and then as they transition through EMS into a hospital setting for instance that um, you know then all of a sudden you know people are being um, <clears throat> cared for by people who don't have that level of understanding and it increases the probability of bad outcomes. It certainly increases their, their vulnerability. Um, some of that really speaks to inadequacies in training and training requirements. Um, those That training theme has, has been um, prevalent. Um, certainly, we're, we just mentioned med schools, um, direct support personnel, um, the need for, uh, you know, training in um, memory care specifically to the needs of people with dementia to make memory care itself a, a meaningful um, provision, uh, training of uh, first responders, training in the legal system. I mean, certainly training has been um, a theme uh, across the board. Uh, my screen just... Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, as as you are all familiar, uh, absolute, there's a, a, a widely recognized workforce shortage in direct care and nursing roles, um, and I think I think we're all stipulating to the fact that there is a workforce shortage. Um, challenges with capacity versus competency. So so this is really about. Um, there was a great conversation last week about how how do you balance the safety needs of individuals with the dignity of of risk, um, you know, for people who still have competency but are starting to lose some of their capacity. Um, and again, back to training, you know, increased training for in the legal system for people who are working with. Um, you know, people and families who are impacted by dementias to help support that. 
um, and, and also to help support having the right, you know, the right type of substitute decision making um, to come alongside people um, and, and meet their capacity and competency levels at the appropriate levels. Um, there was a lot of talk last week about stigma, um, ageism, stigma around dementia. Um, and as a result, um, you know, people who commented on the fact that people fear the diagnosis of dementia. And uh, so there's a real need for how we increase uh, community awareness and community engagement. Um, you know, uh, and, and some components of those are um, engagement in the banking community to help improve banking safeguards, um, the uh, helping to improve the missing adult follow-up process. Um, care coordination was discussed as a model that is currently very uh, Medicaid-based, but has shown uh, positive uh, outcomes for people, and and there's a need to improve access to uh, high-quality care coordination. Um, the importance of advanced care planning and doing that earlier than at the immediate end of life. Um, there was a lot, there's been a lot of discussion about the inconsistency and inadequacies of the reimbursement system, as well as the uneven distribution of resources across the state. So these are really high level themes that have come out of the conversation. It's not intended at this point to be, um, th these are not statements of findings, but these will be things that we will be building from um, as, as we get to, to drafting this report. And like I said, we'll have more conversation about this uh, next week, not tomorrow. It feels like it'll be tomorrow. But, <laughs> um, so uh, with that, let me kind of pause and ask for any comments or questions that people have. I've got a couple of, of comments. Um, <clears throat> one is I, th I think the piece about advanced care planning could probably be fit under the challenges with capacity and competency um, rather than as a separate, is that, you know, the, the gold colored or whatever color that is ones, I, I, you know, would appear to be the higher level, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the top uh, observations. The second one is I don't really understand the need for care, care coordination and what that means um, as distinguished from, you know, all of the other items. Um, so I think that needs a little more elaboration. So at least I can understand it. Those are my comments. Thanks, Pete. Looks like Catherine, you've got your hand up. Yes, I was just going to um, note that we, uh, in multiple conversations, talked about the need for uh, earlier screening, and that may be fitting under the increased need for improved clinical training and expertise. Uh, but it felt like a, a area that needed to have some uh, some <laughs> representation on this list. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely admit I, I, you know, read through and tried my best to kind of pick out some of the themes, but um, I am certain I missed some. So, yeah, and and that is that was captured in, um, you know, the the twelve pages <laughs> of things. Um, but we were just trying to do a high level summary. But that that may have been absolutely. one that should have been you know, featured a little bit more prominently because you, you're correct that it's been a, a big part of the conversation. Bonnie? Yes, thank you so much. Um, this, this is uh, a great, uh, great way to, to, to start the meeting, so thank you. Um, I wanted to comment on the, I guess Pete called it the gold, of uh, the need for increased community awareness. Um, I think that our conversations about that have been very robust and very bold. And I think that it's almost its own big bucket because for any of these things, unless we have increased community awareness and people are able to live their lives, then we're back to kind of this being a disease in the health or long-term care system. And so I go back to um, the original big bucket slide that you have, and I wanted to see um, whether there is an opportunity to have, thank you for that, 
something about uh, life in the, the community. Um, so much of what we're talking about here is about the medical side as opposed to, and Doug would be a great one to, to talk about this because in his community, doing so much with dementia capable and dementia inclusive, and it's more than just safety and legal issues. So thank you. It's really that whole meaningful life mm -hmm. piece, yes. isn't it? Yeah, that's yes. a, a really important observation. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's see a couple more hands. No. I, uh, hi, this is Jolene. I had my hand up too. Yeah, I um, just found that. <laughs> okay. I just want to make a couple comments. So one, um, which I think needs to be a little bit or expanded more, and I, I did send you some things from the nursing board, um, this morning, but looking at that kind of the significant work um, for shortage and direct care, um, you know, a lot of times or what sometimes that we find too in in so when we're looking at these areas is the capacity sometimes is there, but it's getting nurses to um, specialize or to, you know, to determine to become part of this kind of system versus, you know, doing research or administration. So I think that, that's a issue that we are dealing with, you know, across public health and healthcare. So to expand that a little bit more as far as, it may not necessarily be the number of nurses, but the number of nurses that are choosing to go into this, you know, the specialty. Um, and, you know, kind of looking at that in the um, con, or, you know, where the areas that we need to improve on that. The other thing that I didn't see here, and I think there was a lot of discussion about was just, um, kind of the data piece of it and you know the you know I think that's been a challenge just even um, identifying data that you needed for this report but and the discussions I heard sometimes it just doesn't even exist so that's really hard to make an assessment or improvements if we don't have the data to kind of be you know to really accurately describe and to measure our kind of improvements or you know changes so those would be kind of my um, suggestions to have some recommendations or findings or observations surrounding um, data and data needs. And th th I think those are those are good points. Um, and I saw the email about the uh, nursing board information. Thank you for that. And the data piece has been, um, you know, there are some elements of of this that we have um, a lot of data, and then there are some that we have no idea where to even turn for data. It's it's it's, it's quite variable. And so, you know, we will definitely be a addressing that in the report um, on a um, you know, on more of a, a subject type basis as, you know, as as part of the narrative, you know, and and then there will there will likely be areas where, you know, the findings are going to be the need for um, improved uh, data collection and even the establishment of of a baseline. Um, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, uh, Doug? Trying to answer Pete's question just a little bit about care coordination. Um, as many of you know, Scripps is, is doing a, an evaluation of my care and my care is heavily based upon care coordination. Anything from uh, uh, families working with doctors, working with plans, working with uh, folks like us that are case managing out in the field, working with uh, people who are doing direct services in the field. So it'd be interesting what his definition of care coordination is, and that may be something that you can easily input into these documents. Thank you. And Trey? Yeah, I was just going to to weigh in on that. Doug, Doug kind of beat me to the punch, but I think that's kind of the, the the care coordination that we understand. It's really looking at the memory assessment, going to treatment, then really going to the triple A's um, and, and just trying to coordinate that uh, mainly within the Medicaid structure uh, is what we've seen. Uh, Virginia's done good work on that, and, and they've got kind of a, an award winning system there uh, that we can share. But um, We've seen success in that in that care coordination model in other states. So, uh, Yonda, Ilian. So, I guess what I would offer to that is when I think care coordination, I think of it broader than um, a particular program or payer source. 
So I want to be real careful. I think we can make reference to other programs and other pay resources, but to me, care coordination is even having good care. Maybe if I, um, because I think we have to consider there are many families or some families, I will say, who um, may not necessarily be formally engaged with yet. Uh, some of the different programs out there. Um, so I, I would look at it from the entire continuum from the moment you learn an early intervention. What does that care look like there? What does it look like when you have to have someone maybe come in and intervene a bit more? I just don't want to have a very limited view. And I think oftentimes we're very program oriented, payer source oriented. And for the general public, who this will benefit, um, I think we have to think just a little higher. Thank you. Yeah, and it looks like um, Jean and Beverly have their hands up. And yes, so we'll start with Jean and then uh, go back to Bev. And I want to give uh, Greg an opportunity and Pete. So let's right. start with Jean. Um, well, I appreciate the director's comments, and I, I agree with her. Care coordination is actually a huge topic, starting when someone would first know that they have this diagnosis. But I was also going to just reference in terms of my care, you know, um, there was a large report and study group done for the legislators regarding my care and issues involved. And I realize this is programmatic because it was all Medicaid, uh, but uh, with my care. And, you know, <clears throat> I think when we look at care coordination, we one issue we raised during that series of meetings, and there was a report from that, which should be accessible. Uh, it was done um, uh, under legislative supervision at, at the request of legislators. And for us, for instance, and I realize it's a singular program, but we find with the my care that the my care when it's not done through the area agencies on aging, which some of them are, but really just through the managed care organizations, basically, especially when you're talking about cognitive impairment, they call the, the assisted living community the nurse there for the updates, because clearly just calling and talking to the individual with significant cognitive impairment isn't always doesn't give them the information they need or want. So we really felt, um, uh, and quite frankly, that the uh, assisted living community needed to be more involved or compensated for their care coordination and providing that information. And because they're the people that see these people every day. Okay. That's it. I just thought it's a report you could reference. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, Ombudsman Robert. Hi there. Um, you can call me Bev. Um, uh, we, um, since I'm on the experience committee, I feel uh, compelled to talk about, um, you know, we talk about evaluation of my care and other things, but there's really very little evaluation that includes the consumer and their experience. And I know that the MyCare study is going to talk to some consumers, but I just heard last week it's very limited and I'm waiting to find out how the, the consumers are selected. Um, but uh, it just occurred to me, and maybe I'm going too far toward recommendations, but um, there is an organization called PCORI, which is um, Patient, oh, what's it stand for? Patient um, Centered Outcomes, Outcomes, Research. Outcomes Research Institute. There you go. Um, you know, that might be, they do great work, great funding, and it might be an opportunity. I'm aware of them because the um, there's a brain injury project that they're doing now that I'm a part of where they're doing some very specific care coordination after acute care for someone with a brain injury to help them transition um, after rehab into the community so they're not like stuck in rehab and a nursing home for the rest of their lives. But um, so that uh, might be something for us to think about in terms of finding some funding to actually find out from consumers what their experiences are with care coordination in, in however we define it. Corey has great research. That's a great suggestion. I hadn't thought about them. Yeah. Um, Greg? 
Yeah, uh, when it comes to my care and we talk about 65 and older with dementia, that's a problem, uh, especially we're seeing more and more of our residents and across the nation uh, under age 65. And so I don't know if that's something that can be considered related to dementia. Uh, we've had residents as young as 48 deep in the disease. Um, many of our residents pass before age 65. So I think we just need to be considerate of the disease and the early onset and related to the age requirements by uh, my care. I don't know if there's something in place to sort of handle that now, but uh, we need to consider that. And Pete. Thank you. A couple comments uh, very quickly about the, the care coordination piece. Um, that I, I think that I, th I think some of the discussion has been helpful because what I was looking for was more definition, really, of, of what it is that we want to say about this. Because like in some of the other ones, it's been increased need for or improving or things like that. And this just says need for care coordination. OK, what is that exactly? What do we mean? Um, my care is not a good model um, to echo what Jean said and maybe elaborate on it. I think um, our members experience with my care has been that it's more of a check the box kind of thing than something that is truly uh, benefiting the person. Uh, it's just a requirement that was established for the managed care plans as part of getting the, getting the fund, getting the money that they get for being in, in the program. Um, the other one I was going to mention was um, under the gold bullet increased need for caregiver support slash resources. There is a, a sub bullet called easily accessible information and resources. And <clears throat> I think that one maybe deserves a little greater uh, priority um, because based on the conversations that I recall, this is going to the notion of, of families and people in the community not having, not knowing where to turn um, early on. And, and, you know, where can I find information? Where can I find resources? And, and it's, it's maybe not so much that it's easily accessible because I think a lot of it probably is easily accessible if you know where to go. It's almost like what we were, what we were talking about, I think was some kind of very highly publicized and, and well um, promoted um, like clearinghouse or 1-800, you know, 1-800 number, you know, call or sell, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, 1-800 call or sell. Uh, I so, love that. <laughs> call or sell. <laughs> and next week, Pete's no longer on the committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've just outstayed my welcome. Uh, on billboards and things like that. So I don't know how you write that in three or four words, but that was, I think, more the concept. So and it was, Indiana, Yonda, I'm sorry, I'm out of order important. here. I want to say this before I have to pop sure. off and come back. Um, yes. One, hate the phone line, Pete. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so just, just a few things. One, um, I know there's been a lot of discussion, and I believe there are pros and cons to every program. So in, in fairness uh, to the My Care demonstration program, I do want to go ahead and if we could just button that conversation up. And, and, and again, it goes to my bigger point, and that is, I think maybe, Pete, you, when you asked what care coordination is and what we want to do with it, I think that's a very good point. What exactly do we want to see, making sure we're more clear about it? But again, I would, I would really emphasize not only for that recommendation, but generally speaking, right? Or I should say our observations that will then move us into findings and then our recommendations. My hope is that when someone from the public picks this up, um, or if a legislator picks this up, or if an organization picks this up, that everyone, public and private, can see an opportunity for them to be a part of the solution. And so for us to do that, while it will be important in some spaces to be specific, I also want to be sure that the specificity doesn't limit us to realizing that these issues go beyond particular programs 
and payer sources. And so I just want to be sure that everyone feels empowered to think big. And um, because this is, I don't want our report or our recommendations to be limited by what exists now. I think it is going to be really important if we're truly talking about having uh, something that can be transformational, that can be helpful to move us in the direction that we believe we need to, that we have to sort of force ourselves to think beyond just what's in front of us right now. So um, I want to offer that up. And I do think we should button up the one conversation and I'll turn it back over to Leanne and hopefully I will be back. So um, see you all shortly. Thank you. I see a couple other hands um, and um, I also just want to note that there's a few folks who have not had a chance to contribute um, and that you may not have anything additional to add generally to the observations um, uh, outside of the MyCare conversation. But let me ask just really quickly if um, I'm just going to just touch on the list of folks that I've not yet heard from and let me see if there's anything uh, that you folks want to add. That's um, Lisa, uh, Jen Drost, Joe, uh, Leanne, Lori, Representative Creech, Representative House, and Director Ashenhurst. Um, Lisa, anything that you wanted to add? No, not really. I, I think everyone's pretty much touched on the areas that, um, you know, I think are of highest importance for the group. And so I'll, I'll leave it to them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Drost? Um, no, no, I think um, the conversation has been interesting and, and pretty comprehensive. Um, so I don't really have anything else to add at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe Russell. Same here. Uh, the conversation has been very interesting, but uh, I don't have anything additional to add. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Leanne Smith. <laughs> I, I agree as well with the previous comments. I, I really don't have anything else to add. Just some great conversation. I'm sitting here shaking my head to what everybody's <laughs> saying. So yes, thank you. Great. Um, Lori, Steve Rest. I'm gonna have to just echo everything that's been said. I'm just listening and agreeing with the comments. Nothing new to share. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Creech. Same here, nothing to add. All right, Representative House. Are you still with us? Okay, we'll loop back around. Um, Director Ashenhurst, I also know you have to hop off at 11, so give you a chance here. I'm good, but I don't have anything to add to the conversation at this time. Thank you. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, uh, Vice Chair Diefenheimer, I think I left you off. I apologize. Yeah, I think I had um, spoken earlier, so I don't That's right. have anything to do. Thank you. Um, and did I miss anybody who's not had a chance yet? I know there are a couple other hands still up. Okay, I see uh, uh, Jean's hand. I don't know whether that's up from previously or if there's an additional comment, Jean. I just, and this may not fit in really, it may have been with the previous discussion on legal aspects, but you know, I think something we need to look at as we see the enormity of this issue is really the issue of um, uh, when you talk about increased training for lawyers, for instance, you know, I think we need to look at the issue of people uh, basically, um, I don't know how to say this legally, but basically um, uh, sort of um, putting family members in the position of requiring Medicaid. And it maybe fits in better with uh, you know, that would help with the uneven distribution of resources, et cetera, many of these other items. I think that needs to be looked at. Thank you. And um, Christy and Jill, let me just ask you really quickly as the note takers, um, any points that you need clarification on before we move on? And Yanda, you're also taking notes. Sorry, <laughs> not meaning to leave you out. I just, I was, I wanted a little more information from Jean. At so lawyers are requiring families to get Medicaid. Is that what you just said? Or could you clarify? Uh, they're please? not requiring them to get Medicaid. But I think at certain, you know, we have a lot of lawyers in Ohio and a lot of them are elder care attorneys. And basically, you know, there are ways that you can set up 
trusts, et cetera, et cetera, that essentially put someone who could pay for their own long-term care in the position of requiring Medicaid. That's what I meant, Christine. Thanks, Jean. I, I'm, I don't want to deny anybody who needs the Medicaid the Medicaid. I'm just saying the needs are going to be so great that that's maybe something we need to look at. I think it might even lead, uh, be a look back in terms of that's something that legally could be done. Yeah, this is Jillian. Just real quick on that, though. I think, you know, one thing is we don't want to necessarily jump to assumptions and things, but, you know, sometimes that can, you know, it might be a, a greater issue of just the ex how expensive long term care is and the resources. And, you know, when we're talking about this is a medical condition, but I mean, it, there's a lot of challenges, I think, in assuring that people um, have coverage for this type of care when when they need it. So I just before we kind of I just, you know, to make sure we're cautious about anything we kind of, you know, as we move forward. Thank you. Um, Doug, is uh, is your hand still up or was that from before? From before sorry. Yeah, that's still up. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hey, Just hey, checking. Gene, that, that'll take another three task force to look at the spend down process. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we can look at that here. Um, certainly, it's a big issue for a lot of families, um, and it's a difficult issue, not only for the home community based services area, but also for the nursing home area. Um, I, I just don't know that we can think about that uh, heavily here, but there are, as you say, a lot of elder attorney out there trying to help people through that process and it's not obvious to me how um how helpful that actually is thanks doug well i'm not I saying it has, it's just something to note that that is a potential issue i mean it kind of falls in with the whole thing of no one gets long-term care insurance i mean doesn't seem any so uh, and there are lots of issues with long-term care insurance too so i don't disagree i was just mentioning it well, I actually wrote some legislation on long-term care insurance, and I realized how stupid I was. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it didn't do what I hoped it would. So. Okay, I'm going to move us on in the spirit of time. Um, Yanda, anything else that you need around the conversation of observations right now? You're shaking your head no, but you're muted, so I'm assuming that's a no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. No, not right now. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all for that. Uh, the suggestions and the comments and the um, additional information. Um, we appreciate that very much. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, we our two topics today are policy evaluation and health equity. And again, I'm not sure that we'll get through both of those, but. Um, relative to policy evaluation, um, this is the uh, this is the bucket and the sub buckets from SB 24. Um, I do want to note that um, Senate Bill 24 uses the language of long term care, and so for the purposes of this slide and capturing the language in the Senate Bill. Um, we've used that language here, but also recognize that more broadly, uh, we've been talking about long-term supports and services, um, and we will obviously do that in the report. Um, and just to acknowledge uh, Pete's request, um, we have not used the, the we've not differentiated here between informal and formal caregivers. Um, Lots of conversation nationally around the language of care partner uh, for people who are informal and not paid and caregiver for people who are paid. Um, although I can tell you um, at the CMS level, caregiver is still really kind of prominent language. Um, so uh, we will, um, whatever language we use in the draft report, we will define that to be very clear uh, and then uh, look for feedback from you all on the kind of how you want to ultimately phrase that. So just so you know that. Um, so these are the the four pieces of Senate, of the Senate bill that fit under policy evaluation. Um, um, relatively you know, pretty broad again as policy you might expect policy. Um, uh, these are the questions we thought made sense for today. Um, when you think about and, and I should say this is what shows up in Senate bill 24. I am certain that you all know better 
than we do. Um, I have not drilled in, drilled down into every state rule, for example, um, and or uh, you know looked at ODA rule versus um, uh, Department of Mental Health rule. Um, and there may be some overlap. There also may be some division in those. So we're going to rely on you for your real kind of granular level knowledge of policies. So as you think about policies um, and, and what exists or does not exist, um, our questions are, what do you think the impact of current policies or strategies, um, what is that impact? Or is there is there a lack of policy or strategy that's necessary somewhere? Um, do current policies or strategies solve a problem, um, address a problem, or do they in fact create a problem? Um, or again, does lack of create a problem? Um, and then um, if you are currently aware of data or you're aware of data that currently supports those observations, I missed changing that word findings to observations. Uh, uh, feel free to share that with us and, and we can also comment on whether we have that data um, or not. Um, so um, I also wanna, it's five after, six minutes after 10. Um, what I think um, I'd like to do is is probably go for about 25 more minutes till about 1030 um, and right around there we'll take a break and then we can uh, continue. Um, and Melissa, welcome. I see you on the bottom of my screen now. Um, glad you could join us today. Um, so um, what's the impact of current policies or strategies or lack of what problems do the policies or strategies address or solve or create um, that could include um, issues around the local levy um, and what data supports those observations. Um, and um, uh, it looks like a few folks have joined us that might we might not have had in the original uh, list. So if I miss somebody, please let me know. I'm going to start with um, uh, Leanne Smith. And then I will go to Lori and Greg. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, broad. Or questions. you could pass, I suppose, and we can. <laughs> but <laughs> broad questions. Um, I think you know, as you brought up your first slide, we did discuss a lot of those. Um, Mm -hmm. in our capacity committee. So there are some really good, probably notes. Um, I don't want to speak for the other people on the capacity committee, but we did actually talk about a lot of those uh, points under our capacity committee. So just to kind of touch on a couple of them, you know, again, the state's role and some of the state's policies and things like that. I think uh, in for myself, I'm not aware of everything that is actually out there what the state's policies are i think we were we had talked at one point in our in our committee um that we were hopeful when when the consultants came on that that would again be some additional information that we could um learn so i think one of the things that i will touch on is just the establishment of the surveillance system and i think you know what i had just thought initially is that is that is so difficult to to define and uh, you know a number of uh, you know individuals that are diagnosed and that has to start happening probably through physicians and um, you know through caregivers I don't know how you how you find those numbers out without going to some type of um, pretty serious reporting system if people are even going and getting the diagnosis somewhere a lot of people are not they're not going to physicians and getting, you know, the, the, the diagnosis. So I think that's, again, a concern. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people just don't have access to health care. There's, you know, those situations that we've talked about. I'm just kind of going back to some of my notes. And again, I just feel like there would be, you know, a tremendous amount of reporting and records that would need to be kept to just establish a surveillance system. I think it's a great idea. I think it would be helpful, but I, again, don't know where that starts or how you kind of, you know, give give people more work to do in that area. Um, I think that's pretty much probably what I want to touch on with, with all of these, because, again, the state's role and the state's policies are really something I'm probably not as familiar with. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks. Lori. 
Lori, are you still with us? Sorry, I am. I had to step away for a moment. Um, I don't think I have anything to contribute right this second. But thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna. We're gonna go to Greg, and then we'll stop for a second and and see if there's additional uh, kind of feedback or conversation around the comments you've heard so far. So, Greg. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll speak more from institutional care. I think there are some decent policies out there related to. Uh, care guidelines uh, for institutional care, um, especially in assisted living is mainly what I'm speaking from. And obviously there's room for improvement on that related to training and the different things that we've discussed many, many times. I, I don't see a lot of policy related to family caregivers. So I think we need to focus on, on providing some policy and guideline for that. And then Related to early detection, I know of no policies and guidelines um, related to early detection in the state of Ohio, and and that is something that's very much lacking from uh, from a care perspective as well as um, from a financial support uh, perspective. So those are really the things that I wanted to touch on. You know, anecdotally, um, I. I I don't have any true stats, but uh, most families call us very confused as to where to even start, how to even do things. And we get many, many calls of we're private pay uh, communities, but many of the calls re are related to um, low income families uh, that are on Medicaid, Medicare. and we do a lot of uh, direction and helping families find um, the right communities or care uh, connections uh, for them if, if they can't afford to put into put their loved one into a community. So I think there's a, anecdotally um, a, a lack of data out there um, that, that uh, shows that there's really not a ton of uh, support uh, and what, where families can turn towards to to find good direction. Thanks, Greg. Let me open it up for just a couple of minutes, um, um, realizing that you might want to just add what you were going to say anyway, but um, but anything specific that you'd like to kind of respond to that you just heard. Um, this is Jolene. I would I just want to make a comment about the um, the establishment of a of the surveillance system. You know, I think one opportunity that there exists is to really kind of look at um, the CDC's recommendations as far as population-based surveillance. And there are some to just make sure that um, Ohio is aligned with that as a starting point for a public health surveillance system. So that's just something, you know, as we had that discussion that that um, came to mind. Thank you. Jean, I think your hand is up. Jean, I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I don't know exactly where it stands right now, but others might know Doug or Pete, maybe even or Catherine. You know, for years, the state was forming this long-term services and supports one stop. Um, it, they really studied it for a long time. And if maybe a part, if that exists, at least in terms of, um, some areas within this um, discussion, if it, maybe it's not publicized enough, what number you go to. The whole idea was to have somewhere people could call or reference and get information regarding um, uh, services. And so I, I'd be well, I'd welcome hearing from others where that exists. And is it a problem that it's just not adequately publicized so people don't have the knowledge of where they could go. Um, and then I guess I would just, in terms of surveillance, I think you have to be very careful given the discussion of the stigma that exists about this. I think some people won't go to the physician if they think then suddenly they're going to be listed or known, even though obviously with HIPAA, et cetera, <clears throat> that information shouldn't be readily available to anyone, but that's a consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. 
And Doug, I welcome your comment, and then Dr. Drost, and then I'm going to move on to the next few sets of people. Doug and Dr. Drost. Yeah, just quickly, um, we do get some limited funds from the Older Americans Act for the Family Caregiver Program, and those funds are woefully inadequate, uh, you know, looking at some of the things Gene's talked about in the all, any assisted living space as well. Um, we do get tremendous partnerships from the Alzheimer's Association. And most of those dollars typically go to Alzheimer's groups to do training and education. Uh, the rest of the dollars are few and far between. Um, and Gene, what you're talking about is the Aging Disability and Resource Network. Uh, there was a uh, study uh, process that looked at OBLTSS, but that hasn't been finalized yet. Um, Bev may have more information on that than I do. Thanks, Doug. Dr. Drost? So that was actually just piggybacking off of that. I think that was an interesting thought of really the, the privacy and, and needing to call that out for individuals as we are looking at ways for that care coordination piece amongst and between agencies and organizations that help to support people. There's been a lot of conversation in the Akron area, kind of here specifically, about creating, as you're saying, kind of like that one-stop shop, but recognizing that then how do we share that information in, in a, an appropriate manner amongst multiple organizations and how do we ensure um, that it's, you know, that that safety, the confidentiality, uh, the privacy of it is maintained um, so that hopefully, right, the, the individuals don't have to go through the same process with every new organization they maybe reach out to, you know, going through 15 or 20 minutes of, I got to get all your demographic information every time I reach out to a new organization is really a, quite a burden for caregivers or care partners who are um, who are who are stretched and thin. So I think that's both two-sided, wanting to make sure we have a coordinated system in place um, that also protects protects the individual from um, you know from that confidentiality standpoint. Thank you. So I'm going to go to um, I'm going to ask Trey and then Representatives Creech and House and then Bonnie to weigh in. So we'll start with Trey. Yep. Um, no, I would just say, you know, from a surveillance standpoint, one thing that could be helpful in lieu of policy um, is really looking at sort of what we would call, you know, operational plans or dementia operational plans for hospitals where they're able to identify, quickly identify, note. And the only, I guess, issue with that is where does that data go? How does that data uh, remain secure if it is coming from a hospital? Um, and, and how does the state extrapolate that data utilizing that at scale, um, I think are the questions. But, you know, starting with an operational plan at the hospital level, that's kind of the first, one of the first areas of, of entry um, at the state level. And also um, even looking at physicians. I think obviously uh, physicians are sort of um, at, on that front line. So is there something there? Uh, through surveillance that we can, you know, do to 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 get data and and kind of work from that standpoint. Um, beyond that, I don't have anything else to add. I think you know pretty much, you know, from a policy standpoint, um, a lot of the things that we've already said in previous meetings are on par with what we would think makes sense. Thanks, Trey. Representative Creech. No, I, I'm. I, Listening to Trey, I agree. You know, as a as a new legislator, I don't know what's been done in the past, but I'm glad that this is in place. Um, I think it's um, we're moving in the right direction, and I'm all ears. So sorry, I don't have a lot to add, but I am listening. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Um, and let me just check and see if Representative House. I'm here. Great. Yeah, okay. I mean, I I know we have talked about with regarding the surveillance system, maybe even the way we talk about it. I mean, I know people are like really, really sensitive about being watched and followed, even though we all are watched and followed, hence all the marketing that comes to us. So I think we just need to have some real conversation. I mean, no, seriously. I mean, I think we sometimes we get like real sensitive over things that we really don't need to. And if you talk about this in a way that, um, can help people understand like the real 
I, th I think the real like danger and harm that comes from secrecy, um, you know, um, it, it really is problematic and it, it just can cause a lot of issues. So um, I think about the language that we use in talking about becoming a partner, you know what I'm saying, or becoming community members to know just who is where and how we could be of service and help people um, versus having people like suffer in silence. Um, could potentially get people um, in a better mindset to sharing, recognizing when there are things that are wrong, you know, um, and 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 for those who notice things are wrong or, you know, just things that are not necessarily in the normal pattern, uh, be willing to come forward or work with people to kind of get the help and support they need. Um Policy and strategy, I know I've said it 50 million times, like having a different way, specifically from the government standpoint, we have so many facts and figures. And a lot of times we are so lax and actually taking decisive action. And I don't know <laughs> how realistic that is to like hold um, policymakers, legislators, like give them a grade or something, <laughs> you know, on what they can be doing based on the data that we are collecting. Um, specifically to ensure that uh, families really um, just are better supported, you know, in, in the work that government does. Um, that's it. Thank you. And Bonnie. Thank you, Leanne. Um, I just want to go um, up in the air 30,000 feet again for, for a couple of minutes um, from my perspective. And going back to the original slide, of um, the policies of an A4 and C16 focus specifically on those who have been diagnosed. And this kind of goes back to uh, Leanne's original comment that in our state, so few people are diagnosed that we do have to really think about how we're even wording um, our policy. Um, I say that because um, I'm concerned that unless we really think carefully and help define, because as the director said, this, this report is for everyone, unless we really help people understand the difference between Alzheimer's disease and, and dementia as a series of symptoms and then other dementias, and we just talk about diagnosis without helping people understand that these, dementia is symptoms, it's not a disease. We will be doing, um, I think, a disservice um, to our state. And I say this in part because as we are starting to diagnose different dementias earlier, um, and getting back to Leanne's point, um, who are we going to surveil? Um, what does it mean if you have a diagnosis or if um, you don't have a diagnosis because everybody is at a different stage um, in dementia. And that's going to be just so difficult for folks to, to really think about. So I guess my message is I hope that before we get to the policy, we are clearly defining what we are talking about, separating out disease from symptoms and ensuring that we understand that as we diagnose earlier, terminology may need to change. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. So we have about seven minutes before we're going to take a break. Um, I see Dr. Drost's hand, Sally's hand. So let me um, open up for comment um, and then Pete's hand as well. So Sally. Thank you. Um, I just had a couple of comments in addition to what everyone else has um, said. One of the things that I was thinking about as we as I look at A1, in regards to family um, caregiver support and assistance for those um, in the earlier stages is um, I know that there are some great supports at the state level for people who are still working, whether that's the caregivers um, or the individuals themselves. Um, but, you know, perhaps maybe there's some additional ways that we could be putting some recommendations to help people who are still in the workforce. Um, I know um, COVID was a great example of a lot of our family caregivers um, really struggled um, with caregiving and balancing work. And, um, you know, now that we're moving outside of COVID, um, you know, I think they're still struggling with those issues. 
Um, you, you know, I know that there's tax breaks, breaks in place now and some family leave, but perhaps as we think about people who are in the workforce, you know, there might be some things at the state level from a policy standpoint that we may want to look to adopt, um, as well as people who um, are experiencing memory loss. And I think it goes back to Bonnie's point in regards to, are you talking about symptoms? Because um, certainly, you know, I think there are people still in the workforce um, who could remain in the workforce for a period of time with some support. Um, so that was one um, thing I wanted to bring up. Um, real quickly, I know that, um, and maybe this just supports um, uh, some of the earlier comments, uh, many, it's probably been about 10 years, I, I, the, the BRIFIS system did try and collect some surveillance data, but I think they really struggled with um, capturing some information, if I remember correctly. It's been some time, so excuse me if I'm not real clear on it, but it might be good to go back to the public health system to see what was collected before, because it might provide us um, some information that can put things in context um, um, as we look forward to, if we look to make some recommendations of recapturing data again, because I, I, if I remember correctly, I think part of when the public health system tried to collect some information, it, you know, people weren't even recognizing symptoms of, of dementia. And, and so, and I think this goes back 10 years ago. So I apologize for the, the delay uh, or for the, the, the lack of knowledge with that. Um, and then in regards to, um, and I, I would need to turn to the folks that work at the, the state government level, but when we talk about um, policies and strategies under C-16 um, to evaluate, you know, sometimes I, I think about um, you know, uh, um, we offer a lot of programs and how are we evaluating impact? And then, you know, it, it, are our systems set up that, um, it, you know, can we be nimble as we look at impact? And if um, programs are making a difference, how do we replicate them? But if we're not seeing impact, you know, what can we do to free up the system um, so that state government, area agencies, and so forth can act more nimbly um, to re reallocate funding for initiatives for, um, you know, impact. So uh, that's very vague and broad, but um, it's just something to think about as we talk about evaluation, because um, I do wonder sometimes if we're evaluating the impact of what we're funding. And I don't have knowledge of that, so we might be doing it, and I'm just not aware. So that's Thanks. Thanks, Sally. Um, so, um, Melissa, I see your hand and Pete's hand and uh, Vice Chair uh, Diefenheimer's hand. Um, can we go to Melissa and then can we take a break after that and then we'll come back and start with um, the other two hands that are up? Will that work for folks? Thumbs up. For, OK, so Melissa, um, let me turn to you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I just kind of have a quick observation, um, and I, I'm glad I'm not the only one that was like reading these policy evaluation and the state's policies, and I was like, I don't honestly know what the state's policies are. Um, so I was glad to hear some people share that as well, and I think that's an observation that we should strive to change with our task force recommendations to ensure that there are clear-cut policies moving forward for the state of Ohio, which I think we are doing. Um, so that's more of an observation. I am one of those people that also moving to A4 do not like surveillance systems. I realize I'm being surveilled, but if we can maybe just change the, le the language to a voluntary registration or database, something more general than that um, in our recommendations and report, that would be my preference. I'm also going to try and find something because I believe there is already something like that in existence and it's a voluntary registration and allows um, law enforcement to know it, when they come across a particular individual, hey, there may be um, some sort of mental illness or there may be some sort of um, dementia related issue so that law enforcement can treat them differently. I'm gonna see if I can find that and I'll share it with the group if I can, that might be something good to model our recommendation off for that part. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to suggest we take a quick break, um, and the hands that I see at the moment are um, Jolene and Catherine and Pete, um, so I'm going to call for a break. It's 1029, come back at 1040 um, in 11 minutes, whatever time your computer says, and uh, we will reconvene. Thanks, all.
Jill, we're on a break. OK, I was just trying to log back in because my video wasn't working. Oh, it is now. I, yeah, so my video is now. Thank you so much. Yeah. We can see you.
Hey, Pete. Yes, sir. And what year did you graduate from Kenyon? 1979. So we were there at the same time. I graduated. Yeah, I, I graduated was, in 81. Weren't you a swimmer? Weren't you a Dell? No, I was a football player. <laughs> oh, okay. We, we weren't very. I was a beta. We weren't very good in football, as you well know. So. <laughs> yeah, that hasn't changed. I don't think. No, no. In fact, they they've actually gotten worse. <laughs> Did you swim? No, no. I was just uh, I was a townie. Uh, uh, there for the education. Uh, Actually, I played, I played golf, but our golf team was even worse than the football team. So. <laughs> but we had some uh, – Terry Brog and Bill Samstag actually played on a golf team, believe it or not. From well, you know, Brog, Brog is, uh, has a Ph.D. in physics. Does he, really? actually, he actually heads one of the big um, um, national labs out, out around Philadelphia. No kidding. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, done, done quite well for himself. And then right. Samstag – Sam Stag is up here, and we get together uh, before the pandemic. We got together about once a quarter. Oh, cool. What? Uh, where did you live then? Um, what dorms? Yeah. Um, I was at Mather mostly. Like I was, on, I was independent, so okay. I wasn't right. any of the fraternity ones. Yeah, I lived on the on the ground floor, just by that stupid rock. <laughs> that was the dumbest thing I was ever part of. <laughs> so, all right, thanks. Sure thing. You know, Doug, uh, Dave Gifford from um, the HCA, uh, the, the CMO there, was a Kenyan graduate, too, but I believe it was quite a bit after us, maybe a, a, a few years. Yeah. Um, niece, actually, Dave Niece used to work for my dad. So write it in Sunbury, if you know where that is. So. Yep. Yeah. All right, I'm going to bring us back together if I can. I have 1041. I'm just about a minute. I was thinking 1041 was the time to start, and I realize I'm a minute late. I apologize for that. Um, all right, so we were talking about policy evaluation. We had a couple of folks who had their hands raised. Um, Vice Chair Dieferheimer, uh, I think Pete, you are actually next, and then Catherine. Um, and then just so that you know, um, We'll move on to commentary from um, Lisa and Joe and uh, Bev Laubert um, after our uh, folks that have their hands raised. So, Pete. OK, well, thank you. And I, I do want to say, um, first off, I thought Bonnie's comment was, was I love that dementia is symptoms, not a disease. I, I think that that really informs a lot of things when we think about it that way. Um, <clears throat> relative to the surveillance, I agree with what a lot of people have said. I'm not sure that having a having a um, a registry or so, especially anything that's public, which I realize a registry wouldn't necessarily be public, um, isn't isn't really a good thing in today's world. But I would go back to something that we talked about previously, and just to bring that up again was that that we really do need to increase screening um particularly like when a when a physician is taking a history and physical you know that shouldn't just be physical it should also be cognitive and and that information then can be maybe it doesn't go into a registry or a surveillance type of thing but it goes in it could be helpful to the family uh, or possibly to the individual themselves, uh, depending on where they are in the process. Um, relative to the policy aspect, I think 
somebody somebody said i guess it was melissa uh, at the very end there said you know she didn't know what the state's policies were and i, I think that's that's the point um this this uh task force exists because there isn't a uh, i guess you'd say coordinated state policy around dementia and there are there are various policies out there that are bits and pieces of things like for example we have an alzheimer's respite program which is very underfunded, as I think was mentioned previously. But, um, you know, that's a policy of a sort, but it doesn't really fit into a comprehensive policy um, that the state is that the state has adopted. And again, I think that's the purpose for this group existing. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Dieferheimer, did you want to add information? Yeah, just um, real quickly, I wanted to kind of touch on the surveillance system. Just, you know, from a public health perspective, um, well, for one, I believe that someone had mentioned the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and that's a survey that, that we do do in Ohio every year. Um, it's part of a national CDC survey, and that does have a module um, that's on there, uh, cognitive decline and also a caregiver module, which are both optional. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as far as when I had mentioned earlier, some of the recommendations of, you know, CDC is to kind of administer those modules on either, you know, every other year or an annual basis to kind of have a baseline and to look at that. But also, um, as we're talking about establishment of surveillance systems, and there might be a better way word to explain it, but you know, at health, we we do look at we do have um, multiple public health surveillance systems, and they range depending on where you have reportable diseases. But there are other ways to also look and um, kind of have a surveillance system based on existing data that can help get you to some of that information and making sure you know looking at diagnosis um, from hospital claims or, you know, other sources of data. So, you know, sometimes we can do public health surveillance and we don't necessarily need to have a reporting system that has identified um, a public health or um, um, PHI, which is um, the actual identifiable data. So those are just some ways that I think it's important when we look at that recommendation data that we do need to have that monitoring and that baseline and establishing kind of those public health surveillance systems, but we don't need to kind of be tied to that. It's going to be a reporting system where, you know, it's name-based reporting and, and that kind of stuff. So um, just kind of a thought out there. Thank you. Catherine. Thank you for this discussion. Um, I wanted to go back to a comment that Sally made about policies being nimble. And I think there's a delicate dance uh, we've certainly seen in the nursing home space between policies that are uh, appropriate for ensuring that we are um, adhering to all safety protocols, infection control, protocols, et cetera. I mean, COVID has highlighted the importance of those. But in, in this area, I think there's a delicate dance between safety and um, being nimble to recognize uh, the impact of technology. For example, um, we talked very briefly in one of our discussions about non-secure um, dementia care, and we have uh, you know, several models emerging that look at uh, dementia care in a way that is without secure, secure units and making sure that our, our policies are just nimble enough to uh, allow us to continue to innovate in this space and not keep us constrained. And then the second point I wanted to make is we noted county levies on one of your on one of your slides and the existence of those levies. Those levies, I think, also create a real inconsistency um, be between areas of the state and um, where where can we, um, how can we make sure that uh, the the levies are um, bringing consistency. This is a huge ask um, versus creating disparity. Thank you. 
So I see Melissa's hand and Doug's hand. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, open it up to you two and then wrap up with these comments because there are a few more folks that have not had a chance to, to speak and I want to make sure we try to get everybody in. So Melissa and then Doug. I just took it down. I think that was my original hand up. Sorry. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right, uh, Doug. Um. When I worked in Florida, we had an extensive el elder drivers pro program. And one of the big things that we we're worried about is that there's no real good reaction when it comes to a senior with dementia driving a car and getting getting uh, picked up by the police. You know, there are three op three options, one to let him drive home or her drive home. Uh, number two is to have a psych evaluation in a hospital. Number three is to to take them to uh, court and none of those are good. And so I don't know that a surveillance process helps, but it would be nice if we had some relationship with our police forces so that they they know that this person may have dementia and that it's in their best interest to try to figure out a way to solve that possible possibly with community organizations. Thanks, Doug. Um, so the next two folks that I have on my list are Lisa and Joe and then um, Ombudsman Laubert. Um, I'm realizing that Director um, Ashenhurst has to hop off at 11, so I'm going to ask her if she's got any commentary first um, so that she can meet her deadline. And then, Lisa, I will turn to you. And Director Thank you so much. And I do, oops, I'm sorry, I took a minute to unmute. Um, no, thank you for the opportunity, but no more comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Lisa. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think we've all continued to say we agree, we agree with each other. That's probably why we're all here. But um, I think the, the biggest concern is, um, you know, the lack of consistency in a sort of global policy like Pete mentioned. Uh, so between continuity, to encourage that continuity of care and between various levels of care um, and the resources available to folks, I think um, we had talked about, you know, really focusing on an education campaign. And I know um, we mentioned billboards and social media and mailers, but I think a big piece of that would be a simple sort of cardstock document to hand out for PCPs when they do think they're talking to someone who maybe has the initial um, demonstration of of some of these diseases and and how cognitive impairment may impact these people. So because, you know, if we had that 800 number or the website or whatever it is that's on there, um, then that would allow uh, allow people to get started and then hopefully with this task force, we can come up with some um, recommendations as to the consistency of policy across the different care levels. So they so they can make sure they're getting accurate information from everyone they talk to who um, claims to, to be knowledgeable on this subject. I think um, once we do that, then I think while surveillance is, is definitely a scary word, um, uh, I think people are more willing to sign up for that kind of information if they feel as if they are, you know, sort of getting something in return. So um, I don't know a ton about it, so I'm not going to uh, recommend it necessarily, but there's the smart 911 system. I know that Hamlin and County, Hamlin and County down here in Cincinnati is a part of um, where you can choose to sign up. And the reason you might do that is because it keeps you aware of weather emergencies or other things that are happening in your area tied to your account. Um, the other thing that it allows you the opportunity to do is share information about your household. So who's living there, what diseases they may have or impairments they may have that, that a first responder would benefit from knowing if they were um, coming in, including pets and vehicles and all those other kinds of things too. So I don't know if um, I don't, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not advocating for the site, but it is a system that's in place um, that may, you know, maybe other municipalities in Ohio could be a part of that it would uh, allow that sort of information to be collected from a safety perspective. Thanks, Lisa. Joe, and then we'll go to Beverly. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just to add to uh, the great comments that have been made um, in terms of the current policies or lack thereof that I, I think what maybe 
uh, one thing that we were missing here, and and, per, and I think we've probably nibbled around the edges quite a bit, is um, a identifiable and coherent philosophical thrust of of what we're trying to to accomplish. And what I mean by that is uh, when we look at the people afflicted with these diseases, uh, what is what is the course of of their treatment? What's the course of their life after after this begins? And at what point do the do the supports need to be triggered? Um, you know, coming from the DD world and, and now in the home care world, um, our goal has always been to, to keep people in the community as long as we possibly can. And one of the things I I, I don't see in looking at some of the data findings is uh, some information um, or deep information about, you know, the people living in the community. And we've got a lot of stories. We've heard it from a lot of people on here. Um, but for example, uh, what are the trigger points that um, maybe will identify someone who is okay living in the community, but now maybe needs to start looking for some enhanced supports and, and maybe some type of a, a group home environment or, or institutional environment? Um, and I think if we're able to t- sort of establish some sort of philosophical thrust uh, through the through this, I think what we can then do is look at the data points and then and then focus the supports that are going to allow people um, really to to live a life that that they want to lead. Um, we haven't talked a whole lot um, about the patient's perspective. I know that is important to to everyone here, but I think um, if we can focus on helping people live in the community as long as possible, and then identifying the trigger points to, that needs to to step up to additional supports, I think we're really going to be able to um, create additional programs or uh, or policies that are going to be very supportive of the people afflicted with this. So I know that was kind of a global or a high overarching comment, but um, it just struck me as as, uh, very important as we move through this. Thanks, Joe. uh, Beverly. Hi there. Um, So I've been making notes. These may not be in any cohesive order, but um, let me just run through them. Um, Really support the comment about we need to think beyond payers. Um, And, you know, I've my mantra for many years has been that caregiving doesn't stop at the nursing home door. You know, there's this federal program somebody talked about um, the um, uh, Doug talked about the family caregiver support and that federal policy is a problem because it's not to be used for families support um, when someone's in a long-term care facility. It's all community-based and that's great, but uh, people who have family members in long-term care facilities need a great deal of support. Um, There are, you know, it's very stressful to, um, to give over responsibility for that care to someone else and uh, have to monitor that, understand what the regulations are, what expectations they should have for the quality of care and keep an eye on that. So um, I think we need to be thinking about that too as we're talking about caregivers. We need to also talk about people who have um, loved ones in long-term care facilities uh, because they are caregivers as well. Um, With regard to education policy, this has come up many times and the need for training for uh, direct support staff and so on. I think a lot of the conversation has been about long-term care facilities, but we need to do that for home care providers as well at the aid level. Uh, And the training needs to be more than this is what dementia is and here are some tips. It needs to be Mrs. Jones has dementia and these are Mrs. Jones' needs. So, so in addition to that general um, training about dementia and how to work with someone with dementia, it needs to be there needs to be an added module for the individual um, person that they're caring for. And the best way to do that is to have enough staff. And I realize that's a problem. We need to talk about it. Um, that we can use consistent assignment in home care and long-term care facilities. Because once you learn what Mrs. Jones' needs are, you need to be the person continuing to support Mrs. Jones. Not having Mrs. Jones have ten different people um, in, over a course of a few days, um, having to learn about Mrs. Jones. It's not good for the caregiver. That the, the 
person, the direct care worker. Um, it's not good for their job and it's not good for Mrs. Jones. So um, it, you know, that consistent assignment is supportive of staff and again gets to what I said at the last meeting that it's it's about money for staffing, but it's also about respect and involving them in care and giving them some consistent people that they're caring for goes a long way to improving the quality of their work life. Um, so uh, that's about education. And then um, Bonnie could probably school us for hours on age-friendly communities. We need to be thinking along those lines about, you know, we have pockets of age-friendly, um, we have age-friendly Columbus, we've got something in Northwest Ohio, we've got Akron, I think, working on it. So it's in pockets um, around the state. Um, and I'm so glad Joe brought up, um, and I'm almost finished, I'm so glad Joe brought up group homes um, because we had an ombudsman walk into a group home the other day with that's licensed as a residential facility class two by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. At 1.30 in the afternoon, five residents were in bed, could not really communicate with the ombudsman um, because we believe they have dementia. Um, they were, um, there was incontinence um, happening, residents who could not get themselves out of bed this is not a group home that it needs to not be licensed as a group home. It probably needs to be licensed as a nursing home. So we need to not forget about those facilities because they're less expensive. Their families feel, oh, she's there. There are only four other residents. She'll get lots of good care. And there are some great group homes in Ohio. I've been to a couple in Grove City. There are some great group homes, um, but we need to make sure that that people, families understand the limitations of the services that can be provided there. And then i um, happy to hear um, that Burfus has a module about cognitive. I looked at the 2018 and didn't see anything in there. So maybe that would be um, some good data. Um, maybe we could get from the health department about uh, the results of um, the Burfus um, surveillance system. I, I, like many others, think there's so many challenges with a surveillance system when you're talking about dementia, because then we're talking about mild cognitive impairment. Many people still working. Um, and, I, you know, I, I just think it's it's a huge can of worms that we need to think very carefully about. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Drost. <laughs> Somebody had a hand up. I'm sorry. <laughs> you moved around on my screen and a minute ago you were in the bottom left and that's where I was looking and I was like, okay, well, that's not right. <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. Thank you. And I'll take it down this time since I'm speaking. Um, so I think I and, and I just wonder, I think to many people's points, that term surveillance surveillance versus kind of a the voluntary registry. And these are the benefits of registering with this type of system. Um, I think very important in that, though, is um, is also to make sure that that documentation, that planning, that information is transportable again between different agencies, between different communities. Um, even and and how we look at that and I wonder if using a model and I know it's been um, kind of a not much of a starter at least over the last several years in the state of Ohio um, when you're talking about like most or post forms so medical orders for life sustaining or physician orders for life sustaining treatments um, and that's obviously a completely different discussion as far as those documents themselves, but looking to um, you know other communities or other states that have created that type of registry well um, with good input from from the community and using that as a um, as a as the dementia registry and and this is this is me and this is kind of my care plan and these are my people and if I'm pulled over on the side of the road this is who you contact um, and that's easily accessible to all of the you know important important people that would need that information in kind of that urgent setting and then also accessible through you know networks for community agencies um, you know if if needed and and that sort of thing. Um, that strikes me as something that would be very useful um, for for everybody and beneficial to um, you know to those living with dementia and their their families too. Thank you. I think if I have this right, that um, at least in terms of kind of moving through the list, uh, Jean and Lori are the last two folks I need to open up the 
uh, conversation to, and then we have a few moments for any um, kind of broader conversation. Uh, so Jean and then Lori, and if I've missed anyone after that, um, I apologize and please let me know. We'll, um, we will add you to the, the roster here. Jean? Uh, I, I really have just maybe one comment and it may be too general in nature. You know, one of the things as we talked about, you know, sort of a public campaign in relation just to dementia, in some ways, I think it's even broader because, you know. Jean, we just lost you. You did you end up on mute? She muted herself. Yeah. Oh, by accident. Sorry. The. Um, I think we somehow or other need to incorporate in that just we talk a lot about culture change and trying to change it in terms of dementia care, et cetera. I think we need to change our culture just in terms of the our societal cultural view of aging period in a really big and broad way that might even ultimately help us with some of the workforce challenges. We're not a culture or society that <clears throat> not you know, in addition just to the aspect of uh, dementia uh, that seems to honor or um, uh, it, it feels strongly about care of our elders. So anything I think in an educational way that needs to promote, you know, all of aging as something that we as a society and culture should take a part in. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. It is the great equalizer, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's happening to everybody, so, you know. End of life training I do, I talk about end of life is one of the great equalizers because we haven't yet solved for it. It's going to happen to all of us, so. Um, Lori. Yes, you know, I'm gonna just echo the comments about, um, I think Jen's comments were right on point for the things that I had jotted down here is that, the word surveillance, I think, just is sends off so many connotations and I think would be rejected out of the gate for many of our families. But we start to talk about a registry that would look at ways to keep consistency and that whole pull through process for our families who have loved ones that they worry about um, out there in the community, how their disease, their, their behavior, their, their fluctuations would be perceived and puts them at high risk. And I think also a registry that allows us some way to delineate and document the things that are very specific to that patient, that person, also helps us in the healthcare system as well. So I think there's great value in, in a registry and great concerns in the if we choose words that would imply something that uh, pulls away dignity as opposed to what we're trying to achieve. Thanks, Lori. And Bonnie, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, you just, Lori, made me think about something and, and piggybacking on what, what Bev said is, I don't know where it stands, but a few years ago, Scripps Gerontology Center worked very hard with the Ombudsman Program and um, many others to take what was called the Pelly system and move it into the community. And what it was called was what matters most. And I'll give you the example of, because this gets to consistent assignment. If we knew that uh, this, there was someone living in the community, the, the care providers knew don't dust her glass ducks because every time you dusted her glass ducks, it really upset her because they were so important to her. And this gets back to what Bev was saying, is if we understand what matters most and we make sure we individualize it, um, I just didn't wanna lose that because that is something that happened in our state. Um, and I don't know if anyone has access to it now. Um, Bev and I can probably find it for folks, but it was Suzanne Kunkel really led the way on that and it was very, very cool. Thanks, Bonnie. So we have a couple of minutes. Um, let me just open it up for general conversation, see if there's any additional thoughts, um, anything you want to respond to that you heard somebody say.
And let me. This is Joe. I would like to make a comment uh, regarding uh, consistency in staffing. I think uh, that that is definitely an area uh, that would add a tremendous amount of value um, to these to these individuals, especially as it was someone who who might struggle to remember people's uh, names and faces. Uh, I think when you know if when I sit down, I have this conversation quite regularly actually with our uh, home care companies th that we serve and. Um, a lot of them strive to do these things, um, but for a variety of different reasons, they, they struggle, um, notwithstanding just the amount of people that they're, they're able to hire and train and put into the field. But I think um, this is an area I've talked about before, the idea of, uh, at least in home care, of identifying a sort of like what I will call like a certified program that offers maybe a rate add-on um, to be certified and they're doing extra amounts of training and extra amounts of uh, supports specific to this population. This would be one of those areas where I think it, it makes a ton of sense to include something like that. Um, if you're gonna call yourself a, a, a dementia uh, or Alzheimer's program, that, that that would be a requirement is that you you staff at, at you know as consistently as possible. Obviously the details of that would need to be worked out, but I definitely, just wanted to echo the point that I think that would absolutely add a tremendous amount of value uh, to the lives of those individuals. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And I see Melissa and Trey and Lori. Can I start with Trey and then we'll go to Melissa and Lori? Yeah, I think just to piggyback a little bit from, from Joe's point, I think those training um, and, the, and the folks that work at these facilities training and the labeling of that particular facility um, as it's focusing on dementia and Alzheimer's. I think all of that should be coordinated and I think should definitely be a part of our report um, and encompass uh, the right language, but also encompass policy solutions uh, that kind of follow that. Uh, to me, I think that's probably one of the, 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 the higher level items that we could focus on and really start to align ourselves in Ohio with, because a lot of other states, quite frankly, are not doing that but the states that are really good, uh, they've they've kind of brought alignment to some of these systems and training, uh, as well as labeling of um, memory care or Alzheimer's or dementia focused, uh, but also the training kind of backs that up in the states that have, have made those adjustments. Thanks, Trey. Melissa? I just wanted to note that I put in the um, chat section the revised code for the communications disability registry I was trying to think of earlier. That's it. Thank you. And I see uh, we've got Lori and then uh, Jean, I see your hand. Lori? Oops, oops. So I think just two points I wanted to make from our conversation, I think, in our last meeting and today that I think are really important. When I think about at the end of the day, how will we know if this task force was uh, beneficial and all the talent and the time and the energy? I look at it and think about um, dementia being seen not as just a separate entity, but the person being looked at through a holistic lens. And I think that's been some of the biggest problem. You know, we have people come into the hospital with comorbid dementia, but if it's on a cardiac unit, they see them through a singular lens. And certainly as a health psychologist, I know we do the same thing with mental health. So, you know, this is their mental condition and this is their their physical condition as if somehow we are separate entities. And so I think that if at the end of the day, through our policies, our training, our program development, this task force is able to come up with a way to help support families, educators, clinicians, to see people who are aging with all that goes along with aging, including dementia, as part of their holistic care, then I will feel like we've done a great job as part of this task force. And, I, and the other piece I think that supports that, that Trey just mentioned and we've been talking about as a common theme throughout all of our meetings has been that the training needs to be consistent and based in science. I think there's so many training programs out there that um, are kind of their own special entity about what they believe dementia to be. And we have amazing scientists, as we know, coming up with uh, great pieces of information and research, and yet we're not anchoring it back to clinical care or to training in many places. So I think if we can do um, Again, tying into that whole integrated holistic approach, 
looking at our training and making sure that the science is what's driving our care planning and our education, then I also think that we will have done a great job as part of this task force. Thanks, Lori. So I see Jean and Bonnie and Pete's hands. And if it works for all of you, I'm going to open it up to the three of you and then stop us there um, and see if we can start our conversation on our second topic for today about health equity. Um, so Jean and then Bonnie and Pete. Jean? Uh -huh. Mine is a very brief comment. I just want to, uh, earlier were, uh, when people were talking, they constantly referenced, well, having all of these things and then a better reimbursement. I do think as you talk about this, when we apply things across the board, as I've mentioned before, um, the assisted living, uh, lots and lots of people, in fact, the majority of people are privately paying for those services, either the individual themselves and or their families. So that has to be a component of that discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Bonnie. Bonnie, you're still on mute. Thank you. One of the things we haven't talked about is although we've alluded to is there are some of the ideas that are being vetted and that they're very good ideas that are also extraordinarily good for business and they help the bottom line. And what we haven't done or made um, allowances for is any time to cross reference peer reviewed research that shows us what is in the best interest of the family, the individual, the state, et cetera, and business, because there's not, we, we need to be very business friendly, we just do. So as an example, um, there are studies that show that consistent assignment is something that really can reduce turnover. And you can put a dollar figure on that. So is the investment worth it? For down the line. If we don't add um, this kind of research, our policies aren't necessarily going to be um, listed in the order that would make the most sense for our state. So I don't know. And we've got great folks that we all know who do this kinds of res do this kinds of research. And I just wanted to make sure we were tapping into that. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, Pete. Yeah, just a cautionary note. I, we we uh, have talked quite a lot about training requirements and various kinds of requirements, um, but we also have to be cognizant of an overriding workforce shortage <clears throat> that we have, and there is no that we have today, and we cannot expect that that's going to go away anytime in the near future just based on the demographic trends. So we have to understand, we have to think about when we are talking about a particular policy, how is this going to affect getting people into this profession? Thanks, Pete. All right, big deep breath. Well, oops, uh, Jean, did you have any more comments? Uh, I see your hand, it might just not have come down. Didn't come down, sorry. Okay, okay, great. All right, well done, um, everyone. Great conversation. Um, kudos to the Sage Squirrel note takers. Um, I do think that I have the, <laughs> the, the more fun part of this role in the, in the facilitation role. Um, great job. All right, so our second, I will start sharing again here, our second topic for today, um, we will not finish, um, but uh, we can, I think, get a good start on this, is the sixth bucket, and that is health equity. Um, and I can tell you kind of how we're imagining this. I can't tell you at all what this will look like. I think it's a very loose image at the moment, but I know when I think about health equity, um, it's it's really not a standalone um, bucket, if you will, a standalone topic. It weaves its way through, it must weave its way through every piece of these conversations. Um, um, if we didn't know before 
uh, COVID, um, we certainly have um, a, a drastically and um, somewhat horrific picture now, of course, of the inequities um, and the level of disparities that, that exist. Um, <clears throat> so um, we know that it really does touch um, so many pieces of, of the work that this task force is doing. Um, we've uh, shared with you a couple of definitions of health equity um, uh, pulled from Healthy People 2020 and the CDC. Um, and uh, so you have that, you've got that definition in the slides that were sent. And then you also have um, kind of types of disparity um, uh, definitions as well. Um, our questions for, for the health equity conversation are somewhat similar. Um, again, it's about um, kind of the impact um, and what policies and, and strategies exist right now that that help solve um, or address issues and and or are there lack of uh, policies that that you think are necessary um, and do existing either existing or lack of uh, policy or strategy um, uh, create any problems that we need to think about. Um, so um, those were our questions around health equity. Um, I tried playing a little bit to see if I could get the definitions up there for you in addition to the questions um, and it the, the dual slide thing didn't work well. So I can move between them if you'd like. Um, if when, when it's your chance to, to speak, if you'd like me to pull up the definition again of health, health equity, I'm happy to do that. Um, for purposes of this conversation, um, I'd like to start with Beverly if we can, and we'll start, we'll go with Beverly and Trey, and then uh, Vice Chair Dieferheimer, um, and then we'll stop and open it up for conversation. So can I start with Beverly? Oh boy, I don't like going first. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, you are always welcome to pass, and I'll make sure that you yeah, show up. Yeah, yeah, I may want to pass, except to say that we should. I know we're looking at the um, healthy people um, report, but we should also look at the state's um, health improvement plan that the health department um, leads, the SHIP um, and the Shaw. I can't remember which is which, but um, I think that would be a good place for us to integrate um, into uh, strategies that the state has. And I know the Department of Aging has done some coordination with that with the um, strategic action plan on aging, but um, that for purposes of this group, I think that would be a good resource as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, Trey and then Vice Chair Dieferheimer. Yeah, I mean, I think as a baseline, you know, in Ohio, we haven't done a whole lot around this issue. I think COVID-19 um, kind of highlighted uh, the, the problems uh, from a health equity standpoint that not only the state of Ohio, but the entire country has. Um, a couple things that just come to mind. I think when we talk about physician education and training, um, I think looking at that in the sense of uh, diversity uh, and equity and ensuring that if we are doing it correctly, a lot of times individuals in these communities, um, when we talk about diverse communities, uh, they're seeing, potentially seeing their doctor uh, if the doctor is trained and, and educated on what to look for or how to coordinate and, and, and converse with uh, that patient, even if there's not a caregiver involved, um, will be extremely helpful. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, we've seen just in, in just in conversations with the doctor is really how do they extract the right information out of the patient uh, to, to get a, a good diagnosis uh, or a good baseline for that matter. I think the other thing, and we've talked about it before, is, is really public awareness, uh, but public awareness is culturally competent and, and led in a way that, you know, it, it's direct, but also it's coordinated with organizations throughout the state or network of groups throughout the state that can penetrate uh, areas where health equity is a problem. Uh, I think it's one thing to do public awareness through uh, Department of Health or, or through other mechanisms it's another to be strategic and partner with uh, groups across the state that are in these communities uh, to, to have these very difficult conversations uh, in some way. So I think looking at those two areas is, is, uh, is something to, to, to focus on uh, and, and really uh, will potentially provide a baseline of data too, 
uh, if, if, as we kind of move forward and, and get into that space. So that, that's all I have to add. Thanks, Trey. Vice Chair. Yes, I think, you know, as some excellent points that have been made as far as health equity, but it really is kind of looking at not even just those disparities, but kind of those determinants of health and how that how that kind of feeds into the whole system. And, you know, I think, you know, definitely COVID, but across all of, you know, healthcare, we look at definite, we have definite communities that are just vulnerable. And, you know, we have um, different indexes that can look at that, but it is challenging. But I think what was said earlier is making sure, you know, our services are culturally competent, um, that there's the training involved, but also, making sure we we look at that delivery of healthcare that everyone does have access to it, but it does involve more of those societal kind of um, touch points too. So it's not just looking at that healthcare system, but what are those other um, social conditions that we need to impact to make sure it has that system that's set up for people to obtain that, the care that they need or, and, uh, you know, and have that optimal access for life and, um, you know, at their point. So I think it's it's a challenge. I, I definitely think it probably hasn't been, um, there's, there's a lot of work that we have done or need to do. Um, so I know at the health department, we're just even starting where um, we are getting some additional funding to really, from CDC to really kind of increase efforts looking and integrating health equity and, um, and also improving the data that we have so we aren't missing different populations and truly understanding the impact. But um, a lot of health equity too is that that policy and looking at those social conditions. Thank you. Let me open it up for just a few minutes of, I keep wanting to say rebuttal and that's not the right word. This is not a debate. Reply, response, contribution. Catherine, I see your hand. Yeah, I want to piggyback on on what Trey mentioned and actually what we've been discussing here, and, and that's the, the partnership with the community. Um, having um, done some volunteer work in inner city Baltimore, uh, I learned the importance of not arriving with proposed solutions, but working within the community to arrive uh, with solutions that the, the uh, greater community is informed by uh, in order to have success. Uh, I think that if we approach this without that partnership, uh, we're just simply going to fail. So making sure that we really uh, deploy as, as much uh, as we can within the communities um, that are going to be needing to be served by these solutions is important. Thanks, Catherine. Beverly, I see your hand. I just wanted to point out that Tessie added to the chat the links to the, the state health assessment and improvement plan as well as the SAPA. Uh, and then just make a general comment about ageism as we're talking about health equity. You know, I think dementia contributes to a lot of the um, ageist attitudes um, in our society. Uh, and people just think of, um, of older adults as not worth the time. Uh, not worth the energy, not worth the tests. I mean, it's only been recently that older adults have been included in some cancer studies uh, and and drug trials, um, that there used to be limits and there may still be some restrictions on um, whether, you know, an older adult can be included. And so um, I think just generally speaking, um, ageism is really contributing to a lack of health equity for older adults and people with dementia. Thanks, Beverly. Craig, I see your hand. Yeah, uh, for me, it's it's about funding. Uh, you know, what I would love to see us accomplish is that the funding and reimbursement is attractive to a private pay organization like ours um, so that we can uh, allow to have, um, you know, Medicaid beds within our community um, and then it's not strapping us financially 
and not allowing us to do innovation and pushing forward on the things that we do in a private pay model. And so the funding side of things is important. And then also the, you know, lifestyle uh, often is the trigger to uh, onset of dementia symptoms. And, you know, the, the way we eat, the environment, our social connection, the way we sleep, the mental health aspect of things um, often impact um, dementia. And so paying attention to that and creating policy and education and support around that um, for all, all economic levels are, are super important. And so um, those are the two things that I just really wanted to hit on. Thanks, Greg. I see Bonnie's hand and then Dr. Drost. Bonnie? Thank you so much, Leanne. Um, I just want to build on Catherine's um, astute comment and to be kind of a wordsmith. Uh, what I think she's talking about is to make sure that we don't just use the term cultural competency, that there's kind of three terms that we need to be separating out. And one is cultural competency, one is cultural sensitivity, and one is to make sure we're culturally informed. And they are overlapping, but they are, and, and I'm not an expert in this, but it is something that we have to make sure we don't um, confuse. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Jen Drost. Yeah, so again, piggybacking off of many great comments already, um, and particularly the thought around ageism, um, certainly a, um, a, a topic near and dear to my heart, but I think also when we're looking at those health equity pieces, um, really kind of also being willing to get into that intersectionality of how the isms, right, play together for different populations um, and, and really affects their their health outcomes. Um, and then echoing on, on, on Greg's standpoint of, of how those thoughts and stuff even have to be pushed like far upfield, um, you know, not only in an early diagnosis, but well before uh, diagnosis and how are we supporting um, communities in in achieving optimal health goals, because all of those risk factors that we talk about for heart and right, I mean, are all the same things that are are important for um, healthy brain um, function as well. And then, you know, as we look at the communities, I think one of the things that kind of struck me here um, and becomes very important in some communities um, is, is who needs to be at the table to have this conversation, who needs to be at the table to be reaching out for um, those community health uh, education and, and, you know, public awareness pieces. Um, oftentimes with a lot of communities, it is a, a, a faith leader of some sort um, and, um, you know, how do we how do we bring those those folks into the conversation as well? I think is important for us to to think about. Um, you know, whether that's faith leader or an elder in the community with some of the other um, um, kind of more immig immigrant types of communities um, that we see around the um, around the state. Thank you, Jen. Director McElroy, I see that you're with us and your hand is up. Thanks for being able to come back. Um, and yes. then we'll go to yeah. Um So I missed the benefit of the beginning of the health equity conversation. So pardon me if some of this is redundant. And um, but I mean, this topic is um, particularly important. I think I heard comments around age. I also think it has to be adjusted for race uh, in certain communities. I don't know if we've said that yet or not. Um, and if so, again, pardon the redundancy, but it needs to be said. Um, if you look at the data, particularly around uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, I don't think you can have this conversation and not um, be very uh, straightforward about that. I think it plays into many of the other health disparities that we do see. And I thought I heard mention of, did I hear from health talk about the CDC grant most recently? I believe it was about $37 million. Did I hear that somewhere? Someone was talking about the grant from the CDC. Is that a yes? No, I can't tell here with the screen. I'm not sure that we heard that yet. We had listed, um, we have the CDC definition for health equity as part of the slides, but I'm not sure that we've heard about the grant yet. Okay. So there, yeah, there is, a, I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Director, but um, 
yeah, that's what um, I mentioned it very briefly, but no details surrounding that grant. So, okay, okay, okay. So I know when you're looking at just policies and strategies and opportunities, I do think that could be a potential opportunity. And while I know we were pretty prescriptive in what we wanted to accomplish, um, overall, the idea was around health equity. And I do think that there could be a potential um, opportunity uh, uh, there. But I, I think, and I don't know if the group has had a chance to see yet, this is probably something I need to add as well to the uh, to what I send to Sage Girls. So I already have 470 on the list, I have the budget, but I do think if you haven't already had a chance and maybe you have the Minority Health Strike Force uh, report, has that gone out, Yonda? I see you shaking your head. Has that gone out to people or no? Director. Or I know I shared it with you all, but I don't know if it went out. Director, I just put a link in the chat to it. Yeah. And we okay. have not sent it to the group, but but we we do have it. Okay, just, okay. Because that becomes really important. If we're going to talk about equity, I see no need to completely um, treat these as two separate pathways. We worked really hard as a minority health strike force to put in place a blueprint for the state of Ohio um, as it relates to health disparities and some of the things we can do to close some of those gaps. Uh, we worked with a group that spent considerable time and effort addressing these issues, and it's a three-part. One was an interim report that was focused solely on COVID. That's a shorter document. There was a second. When we got into the COVID work, we realized the importance of having something that was far beyond just COVID, and because we understood that COVID was nothing more than um, it just illuminated the issues that were already there. And so the second document, the blueprint, lets you know where we can go as a state. And then the third document is the executive response. As cabinet agencies and leaders, we signed onto the document and we have 10 commitments within that document um, to be able to address some of the health disparities. And so I think to get traction when you ask about strategies and policies here, I think if we can align our efforts around equity with that document and some of those pieces, uh, we can have some traction along with some of the work that uh, we potentially could do from the CDC grant. Thank you, Director. Uh, Doug, you had your hand up? And then I also see Greg's hand. Yeah, I may have said this before, but um, you know, when I was growing up, everybody told me if I followed the golden rule, I was probably in pretty good shape. But as I get older, it's not the golden rule that seems to be at, at issue. It's the platinum rule to treat people the way they want to be treated. And we had a, I had a, a client who became a friend. Her um, heritage uh, can be traced to the Moors, I believe, in the Middle East. And she went into a doctor's office, um, felt that she was disrespected, did not agree, did not take the doctor's advice and uh, lessened a couple of weeks, died of a heart attack. And so what I'm saying is that we need to find ways in every part, everything that we do in aging to make sure something like that never happens again. So if we have comp cultural competency, whatever it is, to get to a place that it doesn't happen again, um, I'd certainly like to see best practice and figure out how we can uh, guard against that. Thanks, Doug. Platinum rule is uh, at the core of good persons under practices uh, teaching that we do, um, understanding what's important to people um, and then figuring out what's important for and how to balance that. Um, really important part of that work. Um, Jen, do you still have your hand up or was that, are you jumping back in? Okay, <laughs> just checking. Um, okay, um, so let me just check on time here, 11.37. Um, we've got a little bit more time. We'll keep going. Um, the next few folks on my list, um, Representative House, I think you may have had to drop off, but let me just clarify. Are you still with us? Okay, so I'm going to go to Pete and then Sally and then Greg. I didn't know if you wanted to add anything else. So Pete, Sally, Greg, and then Lisa. I don't have anything to add that hasn't already been stated. It's a good, good conversation. Thanks, Pete. Sally. 
Um, I don't think I have too much to add. I think the conversation has been um, really good. I was glad to see that some of the data um, in the charts and things you put in your slide deck also included geography. I mean, you, you know, I think access in um, in particularly rural areas is uh, a huge concern. Um, and um, so I was glad to see um, some of the information uh, um, about that. Um, one of the things I did me mean to mention earlier is I noticed that um, we talked about inconsistencies related to reimbursement, but, you know, I, I, and I think that this is kind of um, implied, but sometimes written words important too, is it, there's, you know, inconsistency is not only tied to reimbursement, but the inconsistencies in services. Um, there's just a lot of inconsistency. I, I know because we serve some rural communities in an urban area too, and sometimes, you know, having to qualify um, to individuals, oh, this is only available in this county or this area. Um, it's just the access for for services to, um, which is tied to the reimbursement. But it, it, you know, we see a lot. I, I see a lot um, at my um, office with you know with the differences between what's available in a urban area and what's available in a rural area. So, thanks, Sally. Greg, did you have additional comments? I, I don't. Thank. You. You though. Thanks, Greg. Um, and I'll go to Lisa and then we will open it up for conversation. Lisa? Yeah, I have nothing additional to add. I got nothing, she says. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me open it up for a conversation. Uh, Director, I see your hand. Yeah, again, that's the unfortunate part of not being here for the whole thing. So if any of this is redundant. We, we actually, you're you're pretty close to the beginning. You're you're good. <laughs> okay. So the one thing too, if you're looking at policies and strategies, if we're still on this slide, one of the things, if it hasn't been said, is that we, if we're looking in terms of access, where services are, where they're needed, to be certain that we do it at the census track level. I think we have for quite some time worked on zip codes or regions, but you really have to look at the census track level if you truly want to make an impact on equity, whether it be in rural spaces, urban spaces, no matter. But that is something I would certainly want to add. Thank you. Anybody else want to add commentary before we move on? down the home stretch here. Okay. I am going to go to Leanne Smith, Jean, and then Catherine. Leanne. Again, not a lot to add to the previous comments. I think it has all been great information. The only other piece that 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 I mentioned regarding health equity is just the financial impact on health equity as well. And I think it's probably already been said and said in some different ways, but just the impact that it has on families that that can't afford to pay privately. Um, sometimes the services don't always seem to be there or be funded. And, and I think uh, Greg touched on that as well for the private pay facilities, having funding available so that they can also accept people that um, may need to go on Medicaid. Uh, so I just, just that little financial piece is what kind of jumps out to me to, to add into the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Go to Jean and then Catherine. Jean? Um, I don't have a lot to add. This The conversation has been great. Many good comments. And this is a huge and difficult issue. The uh, I guess one thing as we look at things, uh, our re um, our providers who do have Medicaid clients in the assisted living waiver, for example, often find it very difficult to get doctor's appointments for those people under Medicaid. I mean, so it's not just providers. There's a whole lot of, it's just less accessible to them, the healthcare platform. I mean, even in terms of something as simple as buying over-the-counter medications, they have to privately pay for those because Medicaid won't pay for them, and they have a very little small personal needs allowance. But uh, those are just some issues. But it's been a great conversation. And I suppose, just based on your slide, Lee, and the um, obviously on the pre on the supporting slides you put in, the disparity in county levies certainly has an impact as well. Mm -hmm. 
We did capture those slides. Yeah. Thanks, Jean. Uh, Director, I see your hand. Um, do you want to go ahead and add your input? And then we'll go to Catherine. Oops, I think you're still on mute. I said, or I could wait before you boot me out of the meeting. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can wait until Catherine speaks. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, we'll go to Catherine and then we're, okay. we're opening up for a couple of minutes. So Catherine. Okay. Actually, I already had my comments in earlier. Um, so I'm, I'm good. Okay. Hand it over to Director McElroy. All right. <laughs> Back to you, so Director. This, this, as you can tell, I'm pretty uh, energized about this particular topic. So I think this goes to the point, if we're really serious about early intervention, um, this speaks to it, I think, very clearly and why it is so important. Uh, many of the services that we offer, um, many that are funded publicly, are really geared toward those who are already sort of in the advanced stages often. And I think if we're going to address some of the inequities that we have to have flexible funding to address those things that we know can impact your health down the road. So for example, having access to nutritious foods, having access to someone, um, uh, to, to, to making sure you have access to primary care so you can get that uh, diagnosis, uh, making certain that people have access to really good information. And so I guess from a policy and a strategy perspective, we have to be very intentional about um, looking at how can we provide many of these things that can be impactful much earlier? It's not just about getting the early diagnosis. That's important. We want to have that. But it's also those things that could perhaps be the difference between having this type of diagnosis and not. And so I, I want to be certain that we also appreciate and focus on that as well when we talk about the health equity piece. Thank you. All right, we have just a few folks left. Um, Representative Creech, um, Bonnie, I know you've weighed in with some comments. I don't know if there's anything additional you want to add. So Representative Creech, Bonnie, and then Melissa. Uh, I have nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Bonnie? I'm fine as well, thank you. Thank you. Melissa? I just had a question. Can you update me? I'm sorry I wasn't able to join last week for the meeting, but what are we doing as a task force to engage like our community partners and the public to make sure that we are, you know, answering their questions and understanding what they need from us? Kind of going back to Catherine's earlier point about making sure we're telling, you know, in our report what they want to hear, for lack of a better word, I guess. And I think there were some public forums scheduled or something. There are. Director, do you want to answer that question? Would you like me to? You can. I think Tessie has the dates, or you do. I believe, I don't know if they start next week or week after next. I believe each, is it two hours? Or there's, you can tell the exact times and how they're going to be that set data? up. I don't have that information. Can you resend it, please? Yeah, we're happy to. I don't think, you know, we don't, we did not include it in the slides and we could do that. It's, um, I'm doing this off the top of my head. So, Tessie, please correct me. But uh, the July 13th, 14th, and 15th, um, twice a day. So, there's, so there's six blocks of time, uh, one for each bucket. Um, and I think it's 10 to 12 and 10, then 10 to one and to then three. Two until four. Two to four. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. And I think um, that uh, Yanda planned on sending out those dates like during this meeting or as a follow up to this meeting. So everybody should have them written out. Um, right after this meeting. You know, Tessie, we need to resend this deck since we added the observation slide. So I'll go ahead and add an additional slide with that information before Perfect. I send it to you for um, dissemination. Okay, that sounds uh, great, thank you. And and I think, um, and Director, um, you can certainly uh, speak to this. Uh, Melissa, my understanding is those sessions are, um, we're going to be inviting people to, to come speak with us. Um, but I think, Director, you had a vision for additional uh, public forums um, that would really open up the opportunity for citizens to respond. 
Right. We so first we wanted to be sure that we had one opportunity for those who would be considered subject matter experts so that we have both the breadth and the depth of information. But then we also want to have the opportunity for individuals who may be living with uh, dementia or have just really good experience that don't necessarily uh, fit into one of these buckets, if you will, per se, as a subject matter expert, but um, or in a, in a formalized sense. So um, I think Tessie, as Tessie mentioned, we'll be getting that information out. Um, one of the things we're in the middle of transitioning, though, which is what we're trying to work through, if you see us kind of grappling back and forth with some of the words and dates, is that um, we now have to flip these meetings to no longer being virtual to in, per in person after the budget has come out. And so we have but a window to do that. And so we are now trying to see how we can accommodate public uh, engagement while doing this now and in person. So it, it's it's sort of changed things a little bit really fast. And so I don't want to misspeak here, but information will be coming out, Melissa and others. So the first ones then next week are invitation only. I've just had some community partners reach out for me reach out to me so I just want to make I sure. I believe that's how Jesse is that how we're doing the first set? Um, not necessarily invitation but we are okay. scheduling people to present and to speak um, so it won't uh, be an open mic per se um, so anyone is able to request those but we are scheduling folks ahead of time so they kind of know what their window is going to be to present and so Sage okay. Squirrel is coordinating those times. Okay, I think so we were asking if, if Melissa, if there are people are reaching out to you, you can communicate that with us. Uh, certainly, Yanda is shaking your head. Um, that's how we will. That's how we will be be uh, coordinating and scheduling, and that's how we'll know who's interested in in speaking uh, at those sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just check really quickly. Uh, Dr. Drost and Joe and Doug uh, were the last three folks on the sort of official uh, schedule for this particular topic. Um, I know all of you have added some additional comments, but do you want to add anything else? Let me open it up to Dr. Drost and then we'll go to Joe and Doug before we wrap up here. I don't have anything else to add. Okay, thank you. Joe Russell? Yeah, I would just add two things, um, which both of which I think were alluded to in, in some way, shape or form. But uh, the first is when we start thinking about um, any uh, uh, information that we're putting out to the public, I think it's incredibly important uh, that we take into consideration um, the different demographics that are going to be reviewing that information and how they uh, you know, retain that information. I think it's easy for us to say, hey, we're going to have a you know, we're going to run commercials around the state or we're going to run, you know, radio, radio ads or whatever we're talking about in this context is that we're making sure that not only we're, we're hitting the right areas, but we're also delivering the right message. Um, and, and the same goes uh, for um, uh, the print publications. Uh, we've got a lot of different section pockets of different home care programs throughout the state. For example, in central Ohio, we have a few programs that only um, cater to the Somalian population, for example, it's very difficult at times for them to get the, the necessary regulatory information they need because it's not put in a format that's conducive for them. So I definitely echo the comments that were made about the needs to get into to, uh, to co local communities and get their input. The second thing I would say is, you know, going back, and I hate to do this because um, I know it's not the, the, the actual focus of our conversation, but is to really looking at the government's uh, states, the state government's policies regarding these programs and how they affect these programs and potentially affect um, access to these programs. Uh, I can say definitively that one of the biggest issues to access at home care is the difference between the rates and the regulations for Medicare and the rates and regulations for Medicaid. Uh, our population is growing significantly in the aging population. There's a lot more people that need to be served in Medicare, and Medicare pays a, a per visit rate. While the state of Ohio is, is largely, even in the Medicaid programs, paying a a, a, um, a fee for service rate, service rate, and there's a huge differentiation in in what the state's paying and that can cover those costs. So, what's happening is we're seeing people being crowded out. 
And as that continues, as that gap continues to grow, in fact, Medicare just uh, increased the rates again for home care services. Um, we're going to start to see there no amount of programs are going to be able to, to fill the void. So I think it's really important that we look across the actual regulatory pieces of this and, and understand how access can be can be impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right, Doug, I see your hand. You're the last on our list here for this topic. Well, that's never good. Um, quick question, uh, Director, I didn't quite understand. Are the are these meetings going to be in-person meetings or just the public forums in person? So we're going to eventually have to move these to in-person, and that's what we're working through right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, get, we can't do it. Uh, I mean, I know we're looking at it for our uh, board meetings. Those folks who can't make it, uh, go ahead and do it virtually. Those folks who can make it, uh, come to the meeting. Um, are we are we considering that, or are you forced? Is your hands are your hands tied? I mean, we're looking at everything we can to make sure we're compliant. So, <laughs> okay. uh, at the same time, inclusive, right? So we understand that there would be we would still like to have some virtual capability, uh, but with the primary meeting set in person, I think is, so we're trying to figure out how we can do that and do it pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and we're still looking at having weekly meetings. Right now, I don't believe the schedule has changed. So I think we're on a pretty fast course right now. Okay. And then uh, one thing that I'd like to add, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with health equity, but um, I, you all know that I worked in another state for 15 years, and one of the things that I really envied Ohio for was their levy programs. And I understand that the levy programs don't bring out, uh, may cause disparities between certain counties. But the fact, just like school levies, the fact that certain uh, counties want to put more into senior programming, um, I think that that's something that uh, should be applauded. Thanks, Doug. Pete, last comment or question? Sorry. <laughs> um, it was just a comment, and I just wanted to follow up on what Joe said, and and back to earlier, Greg had said, and and you know, from a from a health equity standpoint, we really do have to um, put a, pay a lot of attention to reimbursement um, because people. Um, People's access is affected. Um, I think Jean mentioned, you know, getting in to see a Medicaid doctor. Um, you know, Greg's comment was towards Medicaid assisted living. Uh, Joe's comments were to Medicaid funded home care. And everywhere, people who have the ability either to pay privately or or that have Medicare, if it's a Medicare covered service, um, have more access. There's just no question about it. Um, and we have to we have to understand that that has that has a disparate impact on um, communities of color, um, people who are otherwise who are economically disadvantaged, whatever the circumstances may be. Um, that's that, that we, we can't get away from that. So it's, it's an absolute fact. Thanks, Pete. Any other final comments, contributions that you can do in the space of about a minute and a half? <laughs> I will welcome that. Just want to make sure we're not. And did we, did I miss anybody? I truly was double checking the list here, but okay. Um, wonderful, wonderful conversation. Again, thank you all so very much for your time. Um, um, I hope that process uh, achieved what we wanted it to achieve. Um, it seemed to go pretty well. Um, I hope it did for, for all of you. Um, we do have a meeting on the calendar next week on the 12th. It is right now only a two hour meeting. Um, we've gotten through the, the initial at least piece of the health equity conversation. I don't know if there's particularly uh, more there, but next week we would like to dive a bit more into observations, I think. Um, and um, and there may be some loose ends to tie up um, as we 
at this point go through the notes and continue drafting this report. Um, Yanda, any final wrap up? I know you have a hard stop, so let me open it up to you, see if you want to wrap us up. Um, I think this has been a, a great conversation. Um, you know, I think that the buckets uh, definitely allowed for more dialogue, and I think we gained as a as a result of that. Um, you know, I have uh, piles of notes. I think Jill and Christy will as well. Um, but you know, I uh, no, just good conversation, and it's all part of the bigger picture here that we are still continuing to work on assimilating all of this. Um, and, but I do, I think the thing I most appreciate today is that um, there was a lot of things that were more focused on some things that are, that are good. And then we're also kind of coming up a little bit, um, which, you know, which is, which has been great for thinking about some of the report framing pieces. So, okay, I I need to jump off of here, so I shall do that. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yonda. And I will and, leave you guys to wrap up. All right, and I, Doug, I see your hand. Tessie, I will get to you this afternoon the updated slide deck that uses the language of observations instead of findings and also um, has that list of findings, uh, observations, <laughs> and includes the forum dates and times. Great, that sounds great. And by then we should have confirmation on how we can conduct those public forums to make sure that we can announce that as well. Doug, you had a final thought? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, we have our O4A meeting in, uh, with the AAA directors on Monday, but uh, if I can get some information quickly I can do both the O4A meeting and this meeting next Monday but it would be face to face I guess uh, so I'd have to go ahead and, and get a hotel room so the quicker I can get some of that information going the easier my my uh, reservation process will be. Director McElroy any final words of wisdom? I just want to thank everyone and I want to assure everyone that in between these meetings that we are working uh, to keep things going along. So um, we feel really excited about the pace that we're going and confident that we'll have something um, to meet the uh, the deadline that's been set forth. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time today and your input. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.